All right, folks, we are live and online. And we're going to start by asking Zoe to come up and say a few words. Thank you, Zoe. Thanks, Zoe. I'll just stand in front here. Stand or sit, whatever you want. Yeah, we'll give you a Thanks everyone for being here with us today um, and virtually online as well. Um, I'm Zoe Hesidiki. Um, I'm the Insight Threat Program Manager here at CDA. Um, and thank you all for being here with us today. Um, before we kick things off, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land in which we are meeting here today, or where you may be dialing in from virtually. I'd like to ex um, pay my respects to the elders um, past and present. Um, I guess thank you for the opportunity to sort of open this up, Mo, um, and thank you for bringing um, such a wide, um, diverse, um, and I guess a depth of experience um, together here in Melbourne. Um, certainly excited by um, seeing the interest um, in person and online. Um, and for me personally, I think it represents a pretty significant um, step change um, in the inside of risk landscape here in Australia. Um, exciting space to be in, clearly in um, focus for both industry and government, um, and certainly CBA is looking forward to collaborating with our partners um, moving forward in this space. Um, thanks, Mo. Awesome. Thank you. For those of you that don't know, uh, CBA obviously has been gracious enough to lend us their premises today, but they've actually been leaning in really hard the collaboration agenda. They've uh, invested heavily in the Australian Cyber Collaboration Centre. Um, they've just announced that they will be have, uh, standing up a, a, another 150-odd uh, heads or so in Adelaide at the uh, in Lot 14 at the Australian Cyber Collaboration Centre, specifically to focus on um, new cyber security roles as well as uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning and various different types of engineering, but, but cyber security being a focus. So, you know, it's really, really good to see our big organisations and industry lean in. Um, you know, obviously, government can be the flywheel, but unless industry gets behind it, it's never really going to go anywhere and it's never going to be a sustainable model. So uh, thanks, Zoe, and thanks to everyone at CBA. Chris Deary is also online, and he's been kind of instrumental from a, a CBA perspective in helping us bring this together. So, so thanks, Chris. Um, I'd like to welcome our brand new CEO uh, of the Australian Cyber Collaboration Centre, Matt. To get to say a few words. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so Grant, you said be gentle. I'm only two weeks into the job, so I know a few of you by name in past lives. But I too, to, to Zoe, thanks for hosting us, but wanted to add my uh, welcome and acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Wurrung and Boorong language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations and acknowledge elders past, present, and emerging in any elders in the room today. Uh, so the Australian Cyber Collaboration Centre is a mission-driven, not-for-profit organisation. It's, it's all in the name. We're all about collaboration and really lifting that level of cyber resilience across the broader community. So we're really excited to be part of, uh, part of uh, today and certainly what is going to come from this prestigious uh, panel that I've had the good chance to talk to a few of you uh, beforehand. And certainly, as we'll hear from Jonathan in a moment, uh, looking at the Australia... Australian Insider Risk uh, Centre of Excellence and the role that that can play in the ecosystem. I'm very excited about that. And it certainly lines up to the long-term ambitions of our centre to be that Switzerland in this industry, to bring people together to see what might be possible in really critical areas of, of development. And of course, centres like that don't just happen. It's taken a lot of our members, a lot of you here in the room today, especially thanks to Maita and Jonathan will be up next, but DTEX, uh, CDA, Providence, Telstra, DTSG, AWS and MBN all been a part of bringing together this uh, this work. So we're really excited to play a role in, in facilitating that. Love to hear the discussion and learn a lot today. Like I said, be gentle, I'm only two weeks in, so learning a lot, uh, but really pleased to be here and I look forward to meeting you all during the day. Thank you. Thank you. Matt. True to the word, um, the Collaboration Centre is not just about bringing Australian organisations closer together to work together. Um, MITRE is a testament to how far that collaboration message is spreading right now and really excited about some of the announcements that are come, uh, to come from MITRE Corporation. So please put your hands together for Jonathan. I thought you should sit up front. Yeah, I'm too tall. <laughs> um, thanks, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity. 
uh, to present today. I'd like to echo some of the acknowledgements from earlier of country and of the panel. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge one of my bosses, James Dudson, who's joining us online uh, from the US. So it's Thanksgiving over there. So happy Thanksgiving, uh, James. And I'm really thankful to be here today uh, on behalf of the MITRE Corporation to uh, speak to you all. MITRE is a, uh, a public, um, a non-for-profit public interest company uh, undertaking scientific research in public interest. So we're looking to um, partner on collaboration projects that really drive research forward um, and, and do that in the public interest, making it publicly available uh, for everyone in this room. So what that sort of looks like is um, the MITRE attack framework, which I'm sure many people here would have uh, engaged with in the past. Uh, MITRE engage, which is uh, around an active cyber defence posture. Um, and in other sectors, it would be the uh, the space report that we released on Monday, um, calling for some some recommendations to the federal government in the US around standardising space. So that's sort of what we look like. Um, we, we've had a long relationship with the Cyber Collaboration Centre and, and welcome that. Uh, thanks to the team there, Rachel, uh, Rachel Hamilton, who's the collaboration officer there. We work really closely and we, um, we look forward to continuing some of the, the projects uh, that we've done. Uh, in the past, MITRE manages six federally funded research and development centres in the US. One of those is the uh, the Cyber Security FFRDC, which has 1,300 people in its team uh, as a part of a broader team of, of 10,000 people. So I'm sort of here to, to find ways to bring that knowledge uh, from the US to Australia. And I think the, the centre is the, the logical place to do that. Um, we, we were really attracted to Australia through our uh, ongoing uh, engagement with the Commonwealth Government um, and attracted to, to Adelaide because of the centre. So um, we, we look forward to continuing that. We obviously have a partnership with DTEX um, engaging in, in research on critical infrastructure organisations in Australia and helping them stand up there inside of programs. So for those of you that haven't visited mitre.org slash insider protect, um, I think that's a really good opportunity to get a bit of an understanding of of what we're doing in the sort of 20 years um, of, of research experience um, that, that we've undertaken in Insider Threat, and that's been distilled down into a pretty simple sort of easy website to use. So um, one of the, the ways that we're hoping to contribute to uplifting uh, our sovereign cap capability in Australia is, is through the A3C and through the Australian Insider Risk Centre of Excellence. So there's sort of a number of initiatives um, that sort of sit within that that umbrella term. There's some some research that we're doing with um, Australian critical infrastructure organisations, some of which are here today. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to to link that research back to the centre, um, and again in that public interest, put it out there to to trusted insiders across the side. So we'll certainly um, continue to do that. We're we're hoping to hold a, a masterclass, um, which will really be aimed at. Uh, practicing insider threat specialists across Australia. So um, Mite is helping with the, the content to that. Um, James and, and my boss, Dr. Deanna Caputo, who's our chief behavioral scientist, uh, one of my bosses from Mite, um, we are, we're working on that content and what that delivery will look like. So uh, we'll have more to say on that in December. I know Matt and I have put some time in our diaries to really refine that so you can all be aware of what's going on, but it'll be around uh, the Adelaide Fringe and Adelaide Festival, coincidentally, uh, possibly around WOMAD. Um, so there should be a good opportunity to, um, to to get to know each other and create and sort of formalise the structure of community, um, a community of practitioners. I know in this role, I've sort of had the opportunity to meet uh, insider risk um, sort of program leaders in, in critical infrastructure. It's not uncommon that I'll speak to one person in one city introduce myself, I'll speak to another person in the same city in an equally large organisation, those two people will have never met. So um, we're here today in, in Commonwealth Bank headquarters and we've got NAB on the panel. So, you know, I don't think one of the things that Mida says is we don't compete on safety. And I think um, that's something that, that we can all work together on. I don't think there's any competition there. And I think that the masterclass and the community of practitioners will provide a sort of formal um, mechanism to perhaps share information and thread insights and, and research publications, uh, but hopefully create 
an equally less formal um, atmosphere where perhaps uh, some friendships will be made and, and we can all get through the, the good times and the bad times together. So, um, look, I, I think I'll leave it there. Awesome. Thank you, John. So, just wanted to put a finer point on it. Like, it is, we are super lucky and I'm super honoured to have been a part of the journey to get MITRE to Australia. So, for those of you that don't know, I mean, Dr. Deanna Caputo and her team have been doing insider threat and behavioural science research on the human factors in cyber security and, and cyber risk for over 20 years now uh, and doing that for a number of the agencies across the US. Uh, and we've been able to license that IP and bring it down here and be able to share it with our uh, critical infrastructure organisations, which is, which is just an amazing thing. And it's led to the centre being launched in Adelaide. They're actually opening their, their first office in Canberra um, on the 1st of December, and it's the first international centre for MITRE anywhere in the world. So we're very, very lucky to have built that bridge, uh, and we want to really make use of it because there's there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise there, and uh, and I know a lot of the folks that are sitting in to me have already tapped some of that and are, are taking advantage of that uh, as well, and I'm hoping that you guys all will too. All right, so let's dive into the into the conversation here. Um, I had a lot of people say to me, you know, do you think you can fill two, two and a half hours <laughs> with this one subject matter? And well, you could, have you right? <laughs> well, there's no doubt about that, but I'm not here to speak too much, right? So, so really what we, we're trying to achieve today, um, I know that there's a lot of, you know, obviously Socky is, is upon us um, and for very, very good reason as, you know, we don't need to talk about all the news stories that are out there right now. Uh, and, and it's all, it's all, you know, for the first time, I, I would say it's not not just a room discussion, it's actually happening around the dinner table at all ages and all different shapes and sizes. Everyone realises now it's affecting them on a personal level. Um, so, you know, uh, as somebody once said to me, never uh, waste a good disaster. Um, and so let's make the, make the most of, of what we've got in front of us and make some change and, and positively <coughs> move things forward, move the agenda forward. So a lot of organisations in the critical infrastructure sectors um, are, are are new to personnel security, specifically as it relates to insider risk. And so what we thought we would do is to bring together a panel of experts that are, are folks that are actually living and breathing this stuff, and some of them have been living and breathing this stuff, this stuff for a number and number of years um, across <coughs> different types of uh, critical infrastructure organisations. So we thought it's a good idea to try and bring them together and share some of the knowledge so that you know everyone's not reliving the same mistakes and learnings that we all have been doing over the, over the past and try and bring that together sort of into a crawl, walk, run motion, right? So I'd like to start, um, and, and if we could just work our way uh, around this way, we'll start with, with Tim. I'd love for you guys to not only um, introduce yourselves and what you're doing today, but I'd love to get a little bit of history, maybe five minutes or so each about, you know, what's led you to be here, because I think that context and that background is important for everybody to understand as well. Tim. Thank you, mate. So Tim Slattery from Providence Consulting Group. Uh, my part of the business looks at what we call enterprise protective security. But historically within the practice that has really focused on what is called the Commonwealth uh, Protective Security Policy Framework, uh, which came into force in 2018. And historically we have focused very much on the personnel security aspects of whatever Commonwealth policy was at the time. The wonderful aspect of the PSEF, which is important for SOCI because it becomes in effect a foundational driver of what you're being asked to do in the risk management program is that it is risk-based and principles-based. So there's no right answer. We get away from the concept of a tick and flick compliance approach. So you can tailor, I suppose, your response to the context of your organisation, its operations, uh, and the reality of what you're dealing with. And you can prioritise what you want to uh, mitigate, what are your priority risks. Uh, what led me to this was probably 37 years across um, the national security domain in seven or eight agencies, and I retired. Um, but I also realised when I retired that I wanted to give something back. And I was very fortunate, uh, an old colleague of mine suggested a couple of companies in Canberra that might have the right, how can I put it, ethical approach to consulting and to the way they treat their staff and their clients. And Providence was one. So as it happened, I walked into Providence and Adash, our CEO, who's here today, and I had worked together before, and he didn't throw me out on the street straight away. So I thought, okay, I'm in with the charts here. I, I might be able to, uh, to work. So I came back part-time, but I was really, really fell in love with it because ultimately my background has been around people and personnel security. Uh, and 
I suppose this gives me an opportunity to distill 37 odd years of practice and operations and activity in Australia and overseas with our allies and partners within the country to actually bring something back into the Commonwealth space. And this is why SOCI in particular, I suppose, is attractive to me uh, because I'm a user. I'm a taxpayer, I turn on the lights, I go to hospitals, I do all those sorts of things. So the shared equity in this particular part of the Commonwealth enterprise has really captured my attention and my energies. Fantastic, thank you, Tim. Ron. Thanks, um, Ron Wakeley. So I'm a career um, CISO. At the moment, I'm with a little Australian startup called Dubber, and we design, build, and manufacture call recording solutions. So if you've used um, Teams or WebEx, you're probably using Dubber's technology. Um, and previous to that, um, lots of experience in various ASX listed um, companies in Australia. Um, what, what brought me here? I guess um, I, I put in a, a formal um, insider threat program um, maybe seven years ago. So, so one of the very early um, programs in Australia. Can you tell us who that was for? Uh, that was for AMP. And I, I didn't really know too much about insider threat. I, I kind of at the time thought it was around um, fraud and, and those types of things. Um, at the same time, I was looking for technology to replace um, some DLP capabilities that we have, and, and I struggled for many years in getting DLP to be, be effective. Um, we were pouring lots of money and lots of resources, but just getting a lot of work out of it and not really much um, meaningful risk mitigation. Um, when we sat down and started looking through it um, in terms of, you know, what is an insider risk? And I, I had a board presentation coming up and, and seeking funding. And I kind of thought about it and, you know, at a board level, um, the way I described it is there's two types of risks we face as an organisation. Those that happen inside our company, and we call those inside risks, and those that happen on the outside, external risks. And, and that really resonated with the board. I think when we looked at where we were investing um, money, our people, um, for the most part, we were investing in the external risks and had very little control, visibility, data, um, insights um, onto this, into the stuff that was happening on the inside of our company. And, and those are really the, one, the, the risks that we had the most opportunity to to mitigate and influence. Um, and, and roll forward, I've, I've been fascinated with the, with the topic of, of insider threats, insider risk, insider vulnerabilities, um, and that broad definition um, ever since. So delighted to be here. Thank you, Ryan. And you'll hear that topic of board being, um, being mentioned a number of times today. Uh, it's probably one of the most important things that we're going to touch on. Min. Um, I'm in Libanetis. I currently lead uh, public policy relating to digital trust, uh, cybersecurity, and emerging technologies for AWS in Australia and New Zealand. Um, also, a director of the Oceania Cybersecurity Centre. Um, am I allowed to say? Yes, yeah, you just are. Appointed as of yesterday to the board of A3C. Yes. yes. on A3C's mission, which obviously I'm very passionate about and hugely support, uh, and industry professor in cybersecurity at Deakin Uni. Um, what sort of brings me here today, besides the fact that me and Mo have done multiples of these and uh, <laughs> we, we clearly enjoy each other's company on these panels, um, uh, I... Uh, prior to joining AWS, uh, led the Security Intelligence Centre at NBN, and one of the elements that we looked at uh, in that role was obviously what's nominally referred to or commonly referred to as insider threat, even though I, as you know, don't like that terminology for a multitude of reasons. Uh, and the, the goal we put forward with that was like, yes, there is the threat-based element. Threat is only one part of the story. What about everything else that sits around it? Uh, and really starting to think more about 
uh, your internal security <laughs> dynamics as being a supply chain of issues uh, in terms of your internal ecosystem? How do we manage all of these different bits and pieces of the apparatus that makes our organisation uh, and ultimately results in a risk being realised? Which I know is a, an approach that's always taken as well uh, at CBA. Um, and a big part of that was, you know, obviously, there is the personnel security aspect of them thinking about personnel in terms of risks that they can or may present to an organisation, but the framing around that never sat right with me. Uh, and I really wanted to look more at security as an element of the user experience for employees, um, thinking about it in terms of their relationship with the workplace, how they interact with workplace systems, uh, and all of the things that go into really building a sense of trust and commitment between worker and employer or the social compact, as I know. Yeah. Secretary Brazil I likes to call it. So there are a multitude of things that we did that I'm quite proud of um, coming out of NBN and now in the role that I perform at AWS, particularly on the public policy side, really thinking about ways that we can start to instill those lessons across not just critical infrastructure but across the Australian economy writ large. Uh, and a couple of roles that are really uh, quite to have taken on this year is uh, co-chairing the data sector group under the uh, Trusted Information Sharing Network within uh, Hamish's uh, CISC organisation as well as the Resilience Expert Advisory Group. Um, so really looking forward to working with all the entities in here and realising some pretty solid outcomes for Australia, I think. So how do you find any time to do your actual day job? That is my day job. <laughs> <laughs> Tongue in cheek. Of course, of course. Thanks, Ben. That's awesome. Ben. Hi, everyone. Uh, ben Ricks. I work at NAB, I'm the head of insider crime and integrity risk. Uh, so I've been at NAB for three years tomorrow, I think it is. Um, we, uh, When I started, I had a function which was quite limited to bribery and corruption. Um, I've worked uh, mainly in the fraud and financial crime and investigations area of banking for about 21 years, uh, a few different banks. And um, when I started at NAB, it was to look at that bribery and corruption piece because we felt there was a few issues there and um, we actually had a, a bit of a, a big event which uh, came to some resolution yesterday in the media. Um, so so we, uh, we created my function. When I, when I started, I, I soon realised that corruption was more than just bribery um, and it actually involved a whole range of things at NAB which weren't really being looked at very well. Um, so we started the discussion around what what does corruption mean and that sort of morphed into what does insider threat mean and we found that in all different areas of the bank it meant something different. Uh, we didn't have a very consistent language around this and one of my former colleagues who worked in the enterprise security space um, had uh, already commenced some work with MITRE and DTEX around getting some research around what insider threat looked like. Um, and, and, and we soon worked out that this is a problem that needs to be looked at from a centralised perspective in the bank. Because um, you know, the cyber people would say that it was inside a threat is a cyber uh, issue. Um, you know, financial people say inside a threat is a financial issue. And we, and we decided to take the approach that we're actually looking at the insiders. We're all looking at all the different events that can can happen, whether it's uh, an ins internal fraud, whether it's theft from our customers, whether it's corruption, whether it's a cyber event, whether it's data loss, whether someone's trying to penetrate our critical infrastructure, what from the inside, whatever it is, they're just all different events that all have the one common thing in place, which is the insider. And nobody was looking at how do we identify the 100 out of the 34,000 employees who have a reason or a motivation or or some purpose to want to commit whatever whatever those sort of crime types are. So that's the program that we're trying to implement. We're absolutely still investing in detection of all these other areas and prevention and and in uh, you know the security of all these other areas. But uh, the program that we're putting in is going to look at specifically the, the insiders. Um, and we're doing a lot of work with DTEX trying to uh, help with our behavioural assessments because. 
At, at the bank, you think we're we're really fortunate because we've got access to everyone's bank account details and everything else like that. But we also are very highly regulated around privacy provisions and things and things like that. But what we do have an absolute right to monitor is people's behaviour on systems. Um, and so trying to use those systems as indicators to find uh, why people are or, or what people are doing as indicators of any of those types of events is what we're really focused on trying to achieve there. So, um, so we're getting some good momentum. It's early days. There's always a lot of work to do, and uh, you know we 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 love the collaboration. Um, you know, we've been many up with CBA and and Westpac and ANZ. We're all in the same boat and all trying to do the same thing. And um, and and events like this and uh, a couple of events that we've had at the A3C, which we fully support, um, really help develop our education and, and give us insights into the best way of managing it. <clears throat> Fantastic. And so, you know, that cross-functional thing that you mentioned is going to be a huge topic for discussion today because it's it's one of the, the challenges that a lot of organisations are having right now is, is where should this fit? Where should this sit? Uh, and Simon's got a wry smile on his face because he knows he's been through this already. So, Simon, good segue to you. Is a half volley. Um, <laughs> thanks, Mike. Um, so Simon Lee Steer here. I'm the Deputy Chief Security Officer at NBN, the National Broadband Network. I've uh, been there for about seven years next week, so a couple of anniversaries there for myself then. Um, <laughs> and prior to that, I was in the gaming industry for seven years and that um, taught those for 12 as a detective. So I've kind of been in security risk management for longer than I probably care to remember. Um, I guess what brings me to this is obviously Victoria Police and investigation gives you a very good understanding of people and threat and risk generally. Um, going into the casino industry, you get a much better understanding of, <laughs> of threat and insider threat. Uh -huh. um, and built some foundational programs there um, in the seven years I was uh, at Crown Melbourne. And got an opportunity seven years ago to come to NBN, and we run a converged model. So, in all what's becoming more and more known as the all hazards. Um, so, we have the ability, we have one single accountability under the CSO for the physical, personnel, cyber, and privacy. Um, so the reason I went there was that very reason. It actually gave you that broad accountability for security risk, uh, of which you know, I too um, love the steam inside a threat, and, and Min and I worked for a long time together and, and helped set up the program at the end. Um, so from a trusted insider perspective, um, we essentially got the opportunity to build the program from the ground up, which is pretty rare, to be honest, um, and build out a um, fantastic team and take a different mindset to it from the purely cyber, purely physical, it was an integrated model. So. I think that's given us the opportunity in the last seven years to build something. We're still, you know, we're probably down the road a reasonable way, but we're not where we want to be. So we've got a long journey ahead. But I think the exciting part now is that other parts of industries and critical infrastructure legislation are catching up now and helping to kind of lift the lift the um, level the playing field up and level the country up um, and help harden the nation as a target. So I think it's one of those industries, security that. Um, it's it, it certainly can be um, a competitive advantage, but within the sector itself. Any of us are more than yeah, prepared to share. So I think it's one of those topics that's really interesting that you know, we're doing something well, we'd share that and we'd, mm. like to, we'd love to learn from others. So A3C has got a great opportunity and you know, being on these types of panels here, talented panel members is exciting for us. Thank you, Simon. And, and for those of you that don't know, it, it was such an important step um, that Darren Kane and Simon made to drop the eye from SISO. Like it was a, it was a huge mission, actually, right? But to, to say, actually security is more than just information security. It's it's to do with everything, right? And if you've got, and I know there's a lot of uh, organisations in the audience here that are still set up where they've got physical security managed by one group and one leader and information security managed by another group and another leader. Now, if they have a very intertwined relationship, that can work. But more often than not, there's a brick wall that sits in between and that's hugely ineffective. Uh, and to do what we're setting out to do here today uh, with that brick wall in place, it's just not going to work. And so we're going to talk about some strategies for removing that brick wall. Um, and, and it starts at the top, actually. So um, so thanks for forging that, you know, that, that road for us, uh, Simon. And, you know, I, I hope lots of Australian companies are following suit. I know that NAB has. I know that uh, CBA has, and there's a number of others that are following suit now, uh, but that needs to happen pretty quickly if we're going to drive Hamish's agenda agenda forward. Um, thanks, Simon. Um, Bruce. Oh, thanks. So, Bruce Morlock, after Telecommunications Network at Big Track. 
What is Victrack? Victrack is actually the owner of all the public transport assets in Victoria. And when you see M10 Movido and Yarra Trams, we lease the operational assets to them to run, but Victrack is the ultimate owner. One of the things we don't lease out to the private operators is the underpinning telecommunications network that operates all of that. That stays in uh, public service hands, and uh, so I'm running that you know, for the state. It's statewide, fixed network, radio network, and a mobile network as well, to keep all that operational. So what brings me here is uh, the initial sort of light on the hill was uh, we were designated vital critical infrastructure some years ago. And so we started looking into what all that meant and some things we had to do. There was the easy stuff was the technical side of it all. So we got that addressed. But then there was the behavioral and the people side, which was a far bigger problem, which, you know, we haven't solved, but we're on the journey to do that. One of the other things was we had, to the point, telecommunications group, and we had a separate IT group, corporate IT group. What's happened now is we've merged those together, so I have the corporate IT side of the world now as well. So we've broken that barrier, so I acknowledge that awesome. barrier exists. Yep. And the big thing for me in taking over both groups was the different approach to pretty much everything between the IT world and the OT world. Mm -hmm. That What was important, <coughs> risks people were willing to take, and then how they did things. And a lot of that was around, again, the behaviours and the way that they did things. So that's a big thing that we're working through. And the third part is being part of the public sector is we have access to a lot of confidential information throughout the government. So we needed to understand on various factors, what information people touching, what are they using, what information is leaving the organisation or could potentially leave the organisation, not through any malicious intent, but just through people not understanding the risks that they were introducing in the activities they were doing with their best intended hand. Mm -hmm. So a large part of that is understanding what people are doing and then changing the behaviour by highlighting it before it turns into something serious. You know, it could be from a political perspective, something in the newspaper, or it could be even worse, something happening to the trains aren't stopping where they're supposed to stop. So a lot of that is training, not sorry, training, educating people to understand the consequences of the behaviour if they don't change it now. And so that's a big step that we're taking across the organisation mm -hmm. and through other parts of the public sector as well on that side. So that's uh, the journey from, uh, from my side of things. Fantastic. And and that just highlights the fact, Bruce, that not every insider of risk is a threat, going back to your point, Min. Um, and we're going to touch on culture a lot in this conversation because actually the bulk of the risk doesn't come from malicious actions. It's, it's by far the largest part of the risk comes from non-malicious actions and understanding the intent and the reasons why those non-malicious risks exist on a day-to-day -day basis in every single one of our organisations, no matter how good we are at what we do, um, and being able to you know, identify what I think, Ron, you might have coined this, teachable moments as part of your uh, program at AMP, where rather than you know, we all have to do the click through once or twice a year cybersecurity training and awareness thing that you know everyone fast forwards the videos and just guesses the answers and I've done mine, right? And that's literally, we have to do it because we're regulated and we have to do it, right? I, I did it yesterday. I was the last person in my company. Oh, actually, the was the last person he did it today. I mean, how'd you go? <laughs> I, I winged it and I scored 100%. Oh, well done. But like, but the, the, but, the, but the point is, right, like that, it doesn't work. Like that, that's broken. And yet we all still do it. We're all still forced to do it that way. But actually, as Bruce was pointing out, if you identify those teachable moments, and you can just drop those nuggets of goodness to the individuals as and when these things happen, they sink in much better. And then overall, you're uplifting the culture. And, and so obviously, last but by no means least, Hamish, um, we'd love to kick off the conversation with you actually. Uh, actually, Hamish, love to hear about a little bit about your background and then your program of work right now. Okay, thank you. Hamish Hansford, I head the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Centre in Home Affairs, and thank you for my staff from the Melbourne office who joined me here today. Lovely to see you in the crowd. I don't get to see you as often as I'd like to. But our mission is about critical infrastructure protection in all its manifestations. And of course, um, we brought you Soki, so um, that, that's something that we'd love to talk to you about today. But, but I think um, my, 
I've spent a couple of decades in the Commonwealth Public Service and I actually started my career looking at cultural history in the National Museum of Australia and that first got me an insight into humans and um, from standing on the front door meeting thousands of um, people from across Australia, from school kids to Summonats fans, for those who know what they are in Canberra. Um, apparently some of them are interested in history, but anyway. Um, and, and really looking at a cultural history museum, thinking about how humans have created so much success in society, but then you get glimpses into um, human frailty and where things go wrong. And, and even at some point, the evil nature of the human psyche. So kind of the full spectrum of human human issues. And then over the last 20 years, I've really um, focused on the security mission. Um, everything from literally looking criminals in the face and, and really working out how criminality occurs in the Australian Crime Commission, the then Australian Crime Commission, and really looking at the pervasive threat of organised crime, um, looking at um, literally um, stripping citizenship off terrorists and, and working out the impact that that might have. And then at least for the last um, five years, looking at the national security mission, particularly focusing on infrastructure, what are the threats that are facing us, and really, um, really start the genesis about thinking around at a national level, how do you look at national risk and how do you start to protect the country? And that's why we, we've put in place now critical infrastructure laws, but really at the heart of them, it goes to some of the issues that the panel have been talking about. But we, we all conceptually know the threat environment and, and its deterioration. And, and then, so that's kind of one driving factor, but then equally looking at what role can the government play and really setting a framework, setting one that's principles based and elevating for all the security managers, CISOs, um, chief risk officers in the audience here today on, online as well. How do you raise that, that conversation with the board? And so our framework now for the risk management program is really premised around setting that cultural change at the board level, really putting the framework in place to enable you to have that discussion with your board and hopefully both to have the rational discussion around threat and risk, but also how you can invest uh, for um, a more resilient company, a more resilient infrastructure asset. So really that's the, the driving force and our, our role is to try and help at every level to facilitate that cooperation and really drive that change. And I think the, the last point from me is really um, some of the issues that, that we've raised on the panel is looking at security risk together and actually thinking about it holistically. And I think you're right, we see so many companies struggling with people who don't talk to each other, different strands of investment that, that aren't aligned and bringing it all together is what we're fundamentally trying to do with the risk management program. Everything from personnel security uh, to supply chain security, physical security, but people underpin all of those different risks. And we're pretty excited to um, appear on panels like this and, and have the discussion because that's part of our mission. Fantastic. Thank you, Hamish. Um, look, at the end of the day, what you are setting about to do and the way that you're doing it is exactly what's needed right now. And I've heard, and this is just here to say, I've heard that the Brits and the Yanks are actually watching very closely what's happening um, with, uh, with Soki uh, and how uh, this is being rolled out nationally and how um, industry, government and academia are all being engaged in the conversation and working together. Uh, and, you know, I think one of the things about Australia that's really quite nice is that it's a, it's a big country geographically, but it's small enough uh, from a population perspective, we can actually put our arms around it and we can get the right people in a room when we need to, to get things done. And that's an advantage that we have that, that the, the US and, and, and our allies like the UK just don't have that ease to be able to do that. And so they're now watching us and, and about to go down the same path. So the conversation here, while it's uh, it's it's definitely got a very Australian <coughs> context to it. We might use some different words, like trusted insider is what we're using down here in Australia, and they don't use that terminology in the US or in the UK. They use different terminology, <coughs> but it's the exact same program of work. It's the, approached exactly the same way if you're going to get it right. Um, and so actually starting to think about how we crawl, walk, run is what I want to get into now because I know from conversations with a lot of uh, the folks in this crowd and online today, um, it's a little bit overwhelming, right? Like uh, almost all of the organisations that need to be uh, focusing on SOCI um, do have pretty good cyber programs and strategies in place uh, in general, uh, obviously, you know, different levels of maturity. But when it comes to personnel security and particularly insider risk, 
um, there's there's not a lot of broad knowledge on the topic. Um, and you know, when organisations like CBA or NAB advertise for an insider threat investigator, analyst, leader, they're not getting anybody applied. Why not? Because they don't exist. They simply don't exist. You know, we're, we're seeing in the US, we have, a, you know, our largest customer base is in the US, and we're seeing, you know, one of our customers hire the entire insider threat team out of one of our other customers. And then that customer has lost their whole insider threat team, comes to us and says, you guys need to help us. We, don't, we can't find anybody. You guys got to give us some of your guys. And we're like, well, we don't have them either. We've got to create this net new talent. And that's why the program of work that Jonathan was talking about, the Insider Risk Centre of Excellence, is going to be so critical to our country. Because, you know, I had a conversation with the folks from ASD and ACSC the other day. They said, you know, we need a lot of those people too, right? So government needs them, private sector needs them, even medium-sized organisations that are not in this room need them and that don't have to comply with something. So we're going to have to build that talent from the ground up. <laughs> but what I really wanted to start with is, is how do we get started? If you if you are trying to stand up a program from scratch, the the big problem that we've seen, and a lot of these organisations here have been through this problem, is that the you know from the top they'll say, okay, this needs to be done. Let's buy a tool. That'll fix the problem. Just get some more tech to fix it. That doesn't work. It has to be a programmatic approach. It also doesn't work if you say, I'm going to hire somebody and I'm going to make it their responsibility. That also doesn't work, right? So where we're going to start this conversation is governance. Multi-stakeholder governance is what is needed to start. Before you hire anyone, before you buy any tools, that's what's got to be done. And Hamish, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you for help here because you know, one of the things that are resounding things that I'm hearing from new insider threat leaders is that they hit a glass ceiling, right? So they get hired into a role, they get given a budget, very small budget, but a budget anyway, and they're told to go solve the problem. And then they realise, well, I need to involve other stakeholders to get this job done. I need HR involved, I need legal involved, I need risk involved, I need compliance involved. I need cyber involved, I need technology involved. And all you need to hit is one roadblock where somebody says, hey, I've got other things I'm working on right now. This is not priority for me. It might be your priority, but it's not mine. Come back in six months and I'll help you out. And then all of a sudden, the program grinds to a halt. And this person pulls their hair out and if they're worth their salt, they just leave. Um, what do you have to say about that? Because I feel like we need to engage the CEOs of these organisations directly in the conversation, not not where they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we've got somebody leading that program, go speak to them, because that's the typical response. I'd love to hear what you, you think about that. Well, well that's right, and, and it really gets down to culture and the cultural change that organisations either have or are on a journey or, or need to get to. And when you kind of look at the elements of personnel security and personnel security hazards, and you think about a large program, you, you immediately think the task is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But but people that I speak to, you're like, well, what do you do already? And no company does nothing. You, mm -hmm. you have some sort of process mm -hmm. to onboard someone, to offboard someone, <clears throat> and to manage them while they're at work. So how do you build out from there? And then where do you want to where do you want to end up? And what's the journey from there to the end? And I really think that all comes down to culture. And you're right. What's the governance that gets you there? Min loves governance. We had this chat the other day. <laughs> so so I, I don't know if I want to give you a hospital pass, but. Here's a good segue to governance. Yeah, no, that's um, it's exactly right. And I know that you know, we spoke about it for years and it was something that Simon and I, while we were setting these things up, were very focused on. Um, not just because you know, good governance leads to better business practice, but it also lends the legitimacy to the, to the program of work. Mm. Um, which is obviously absolutely necessary. Uh, and in terms of that question of leadership, well, that comes down to clear accountabilities. And mm -hmm. ultimately, at that senior level, you are accountable for these things. And that's something that Hamish uh, and the team have been very clear in building into the SOCIAC, making it 
very obviously stated that this is a board level obligation, mm -hmm. um, which helps. You know, that is the, the mechanism. And for any you know operational managers in this room that are wondering, well, how do I get the buy in? This is something you can point to as the clear signal. We are critical infrastructure. We know we're critical infrastructure. And these are expectations. Um, so that's sort of minimum expectations. Bare minimum expectations. Bare minimum expectations. But, um, you know, as Hamish says, it's not like any organisation is doing absolutely nothing. Uh, there are multiple points <coughs> within an organisation that touches on something along these lines. And a big part of why I'm not really much of a fan of the idea of an insider threat program is that it kind of gives the well, the impression of program management, that it's something that has a beginning, middle, and an end, and that there are things that you deliver and then, hey, presto, that's that. Well, that's not really the case, not not with this kind of a program. Not at all. The, the role of trusted insider program, insider threat program, whatever you want to call it, I wouldn't really call it a program because that implies that there is a finish point, um, is that you need to be that central hub that draws all of these disparate elements together and provides sound risk-based advice on what the organisation should be doing to reduce its overall risk profile. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the golden rule of intelligence is ultimately the reduction of risk uncertainty. It gives you a level of insight to help you, you know, clear ground, understand the things that you know, the things that you don't know, and I know we all made fun of Donald Rumsfeld for this, but figure out the unknown unknowns, that's absolutely true. Uh, and within the context of an organisation where there is that layer of complexity, having a team that has that level of visibility uh, that is yeah. not beholden to delivering on X, Y, Z, so mm. it's not just shaking to a desk trying to identify the latest alert and then all of these different things, that becomes a, a crucially important hub mm. uh, for the rest of the organisation. It becomes an apparatus under which every other uh, security function and business uh, function can make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of real strength in that, not just from a security perspective. There's a security dividend attached to it, but it's not like there's no other benefits that's right like so i want I, like that's a really good point is that actually what Socky is asking us to do is stuff that we should already be doing anyway it's just putting an underscore underneath that and giving some guidance to just make sure you've got all these bits and pieces done right because at the end of the day if we're not doing this stuff and if we're not putting our people at the centre of our strategy for de-risking the organisation, then we're, we're going to fail. And, you know, when you put your, your people at the centre and you engage them properly, like it's an engagement plan. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a team engagement plan, really, at the end of the day, because if your team feels trusted, protected, respected and valued, the byproduct of that is going to be a lower risk to the organisation. And the top benefit to it is actually a better bottom line for everybody because they're going to be doing the best job possible job they can because they love what they do and they feel good about it. Bruce, you were going to yeah, say. Yeah. <coughs> a bit of our experience was along, we're doing it all already. So we've been doing you know, lots of assessments ourselves and we said, yeah, we're doing everything. We only took a recent activity where we got some external people coming to audit what we we're doing. And we took the approach of if you can't prove it with paperwork, it's never happened. And so our level of maturity sort of went from that down to here because we thought we were doing the right thing and we know we're doing the right thing, but when it comes down to demonstrate you're doing the right thing, mm -hmm. we're going to go. Mm -hmm. And then that led on to, yeah, we thought we were doing five things, but we're only actually doing three. So there was these other two. So that was an eye-opening moment. You know, mm -hmm. We shared that all you know, with the board to say, we've reset the bar as to what doing it means. Yep. So I guess I want to share with everybody that yeah, you're probably doing everything already, but you know when you come to actually double checking and things like Saki help you, you know, formalise it, you're going to find there's some gaps, but you won't be the only ones that find those gaps. Yeah, and I and I know for a fact that you you present 
regular reports to the board so they can see progress and they can measure that progress, which is super, super important. I just want to go back to Simon and Min for a second here, because one of the things that, you know, you guys started your program seven-ish years ago, and one of the things that struck me back then that was not commonplace was that when you landed them in, because you had Simon and Darren up the food chain that were leaning into your program and actually would sit into meetings and understand enough of what you were actually doing rather than just getting a feed from you once in a while, um, that really helped in a very political organisation where lots of people are doing lots of different things in lots of different job functions, which NBN considers to be vital, mission critical stuff. But you were able to cut through all of that. How could you? I don't know whether it's Simon or, or Min or both of you can comment on how you got to get that strength of that pillar all the way to the top. So I think when I first got there, so when Darren Kane joined, he's probably six months ahead of me. He hired kind of three or four people to start with. Um, so I was one of his first four, and then yeah, Min was certainly one of my first after that. So because we had the foundation of program, but it wasn't necessarily what we know as a modern mature program. So we kind of, we knew, and actually the, at that stage, the accountability that sat in another part of the security. So, and over a course of kind of maturing, uh, thinking over a few months of where he was sitting, objectively I sat in this, I built out a cyber defence, building out a cyber defence function, Andrew Morgan is just joined now, um, and was in our investigations function. Um, and then we, we knew we needed this capability. But I, I probably want to, and then I'll, we hired Min and I guess Min and I fleshed it out. We had the freedom to to flesh it out because it was new. There was no really, there was no roadmap at the time really. Um, so it was what do we want it to be? And I think to go back to a couple of the you know, first question, I don't think anyone should go to a CEO and say, I want to sit inside a threat program without having a whole lot of questions and governance ready to go, right? Because yep. the, big, the big challenge we call it inside a threat for a start is it's a big brother connotation. Mm -hmm. What are you looking at? What are you reading? What are yep. you detecting? Yep. And the far, our employees are our biggest asset, 100% our biggest asset. And the vast majority of the trust inside a program is there to help protect employees. Yes. You know, we, as a really good example, we force them through to email them, we're surprised that employees could find phishing. But yep. that's 95% of their work these days, so we shouldn't be surprised. So how do we protect and trust an inside a program should do that? So the first thing we did when, when our MIN came aboard was let's set up the governance and independence. So we actually had it completely independent of the investigations team because we needed escalation passed to say if it gets to a certain point, there's handoffs. You know, you, as a trusted insider program, you have access to sensitive data. You've got to have a framework governance procedures that gives both your CSO or your CISO, you know, regardless, but your board. Now, I remember our CEO coming down and talking about it. Um, you need to have those questions with you, and you mm -hmm. need to engage legal and patent C to go, this is what the program is for. This is to kind of help, help de-risk the company mm -hmm. in certain areas. We've got this, but you're involved. You know, from a governance committee, they were involved. So you've got to have those key people. But, um, you know, we, Min did have a lot of freedom and, and that's what we wanted. We wanted someone to come from a different mindset. We didn't necessarily want someone who come from police and had that traditional thinking. And we built the whole team around that, mm. actually purposeful. Yep. To have that different, that different thing. Yeah, I mean, I think with, um, Darren in particular, it really was an easy sell to say to him, actually this way of doing things is not going to be the most effective and this is how we think we can do it better. And that's the sort of thinking that Darren has always been in for. Um, yeah, it's sort of along the same lines as him wanting to drop the eye from Sizo. Mm. Uh, if anything is a golden goose, you're pretty sure Darren wants to shoot it. So there is that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, that, it, it did give us a lot of leeway to do things differently and start to develop things out. And it, it started from a real foundational point, which was, what are we actually worried about? Okay, let's really get to the heart of this. If we really have to explain from that internal security perspective, what are the things that we're actually worried people are going to do? How do we articulate that? And the stuff that was being prioritised at that point in time is really, you know, sort of lowball nonsense. You know, if somebody's looking at a job site, does that make them a risk? No. Uh, if somebody's doing a bit of online shopping, does that make them a risk? No. Who cares? 
Um, so we really just sat back and asked the questions. Like, well, number one, you've got to think about this in terms of the employee experience and just how we understand people behave. Mm. Um, and then get to the heart of, well, why is it taking place? And then if it is something that's really not desirable, how do we fix it? You know, take it up the food chain. Don't just depend on you know, hammering people with ineffectual click-through training. Like, how do we actually remove this from being part of the consideration at all? Like, is it systemic? Is it repeatable? Uh, is it something that scales across the business in a way that's detrimental to our overall security posture? Mm -hmm. Look at those questions, address them, and then put in place really simple mitigations that can either eliminate it completely or dramatically reduce the mm. level of risk that a certain type of behaviour poses. Mm -hmm. And one of the really obvious examples around that is always going to be things like shadow IT and people running applications on their work devices that are not you know, corporately endorsed or whatever. But if somebody can access it, are we not giving them the sense that it's fine mm. because it's not blocked? Like we block a whole bunch of things. This thing isn't blocked, therefore it must be okay. Yep. You know, that's a sense of implied consent most for the employer. Mm. Uh, are we really expecting people just trying to do their jobs? And the majority of those shadow applications are just people trying to do their jobs. Let's yep. be clear about this. It's not like somebody's run some dodgy betting site on their machine and they're just letting it go ham. That is not what's happening. It's people <coughs> installing something for a work purpose because there's nothing else that the, the company is giving them to enable them to do their jobs properly. Yep. So you address that question. Well, why do they need it? What is the use case for it? Yep. Do we have something else that we would prefer that they would use? Yep create the pathways for the desirable behaviour and cut off the ones that are going to lead to risk. Exactly. And that implied consent thing, mm. that is a real problem and that just comes from a poor communication with the employee base. Well, it's poor communication, but it's also things like, you know, warnings fatigue. If something comes up constantly, this is a warning, you know, you come up this warning and you're going to have to click this to say that, yeah, I understand that this is risky, I'm going to click through. Well, after the first mm -hmm. three of those, you learn to ignore them. There's, mm -hmm. there's academic research around mm -hmm. that, the habituation of mm -hmm. warning signals. Mm -hmm. And we went right at the beginning when I started in that job and I said, pop up warnings. That it's not just that they don't help, they actually make the situation worse. worse. Um, so these are the sorts of things that you need to address. Mm -hmm. If it's just going to annoy somebody, they're not going to follow it. <clears throat> That's right. Uh, humans are fundamentally lazy. We naturally divert to the shortest path, shortest and easier path, particularly if there's something that we just want to achieve. Mm -hmm. We'll just run right on ahead and do that. Yep. It's not them trying to be malicious inside of it. It's just somebody going, I've got to knock off at five and I can't be bothered dealing with this tomorrow. And so being able to differentiate between intent is also important, right? Mm -hmm. So because if somebody does behaviour A, with malintent versus someone who does behaviour A with good intent to do the right thing, they should not be escalated in the same path and dealt with in the same manner. Absolutely. And and so without that context, you know, the organisation's lost and often they're bringing a big stick when they should be bringing a carrot to the table and humans don't like that. Humans don't like that when I've done something really good, I'm trying really hard, and you just keep hitting me. That's that's counterproductive on so many different levels. But cybersecurity has done that to all of us for so many years, right? Put more controls in place, put more controls in place. The more you put controls in place, the more you force people to find more difficult ways to stop, to do things. Anyway, yeah. That's the other thing I just want to add was about the behaviour. And you picked the episode about uh, uh, looking at a job site. So one of the things we've found out, we have some people that look at job sites in a consistent way throughout their day or week. It's when we find that they're changing their behaviour. So they might look at it every day, and then they change to looking at it three times a day. So the behaviour in itself is not an absolute, whether it's good or bad. Mm -hmm. One of the key things that we're looking at is when people change that behaviour, that that's telling us something has happened. And then that's a good indicator 
you know, that could lead and escalate. So it's those sorts of behavioural things, but it's more about the change in the behaviour, which for us is becoming more important to understand that something's happening in the organisation or potentially going to happen, mm. rather than just that, that absolute that we were talking about before. Mm. Ryan, you going to say? Yeah, look, I agree with, with, with all the points. I think when I was looking at putting um, an, an insider capability, I totally agree, like building something like this as a program that has an end date is, is like building a cyber program. Mm. It doesn't have an end date. It has an end date. Yeah. Um, it sort of implies is... that we'll get there and that'll be done. Um, when we were looking at it in the early days, what I was really looking to do was um, seek to understand what is the scale of our of our you know, of, the, of the data loss problem. We, we thought you know or risk thought we had a data loss problem. Yeah. <clears throat> what is the scale? How big? so that we can work out what controls we need. And, mm -hmm. and, and I was really looking for um, a, an extension to um, just blocking things like USBs and, and webmail, because it was just turning into a, a really clunky process, mm -hmm. not really adding measurable risk reduction, but not anything I could report in an in, with integrity to a board. Mm -hmm. So look at what we've done here, this is reducing risk. Um, I was looking to extend um, our awareness program, and, and at the time we were doing a lot of fishing. And you know, our awareness program was effectively a fishing program, and there was nothing more to it. It was and nothing more thought, to it than that. Yeah, there's got and, to be more to know, awareness there's a, than there's just a ton of people that are online and in this room um, that I bet their awareness program yeah. is just that right now. And, and and so what we were looking to do is find, and, and you mentioned before, teachable moments. What are um, things that people do that are not ideal from a risk perspective for us, mm. where we can um, give training in near real time mm -hmm. on their laptop um, that would reduce risk? Um, and and really the basis for that is what we were trying to do is, um, and, and, and I still seek to do this in every role I have, when you make the right way, the easiest way, um, then that will always happen. And, and I think you said it before, when you make the wrong way um, easy, that's what people will do. So um, really the biggest benefit we got out of the Insider um, Risk Management or Insider Threat Program was this, this volume of data, of actionable insights um, about teachable moments, about behaviours that we were creating as a technology division and mm -hmm. a cyber division. Um, that were driving our staff to do things that were um, very high risk for them, and, and basically, when we looked at it with a with a you know with a very um, uh, objective view, that was the fault of us, mm. not of of our of our staff and team members, and and that was probably the biggest value add we got out of the entire program. Can can you talk about because you you've used this before when you said actionable insights that reminded me that you talk about a process of getting to actionable insights, which if you don't do this process, you will never convince the board, you will never be able to articulate anything to the board. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, okay. Um, you, you know, spot I'm going to try to remember it. Um, Start with data. Yeah. So this came about, you, you know, everybody in security um, uses logging, analytics, well, type tool, and, you know, like cyber guys love that type of thing. Um, and if you've ever built any of those tools, you'll know how um, how expensive they become to run when you're not really, really clear on what you want to get out of it. Yep. Um, and so when I um, when I first became a CISO, um, you know, you, you want to make it you want to make a difference. You want to save some costs, those types of things. And and those types of tools are a great place to start. Um, so I, we came up with this methodology that says. You know, we're, we're gonna, we know we have a lot of data. We want to turn data into information. What does that mean? It means put context on it, you know? Um, and and context can be really easy, you know? One, two, three, four could be um, could be the start of a credit card number. I don't think it could, but you, you get the point. It could be a date of birth. It could be all sorts of things, but when you know what it is, you've added context. And that's not particularly valuable to anybody other than guys and, and, and girls in cyber or fraud prevention type teams. But if you can take data and turn it into information, 
and then turn it into an insight and turn the insight into an actionable insight and turn the actionable insight into action, then you've just created, created a value chain and you can apply that. I, I know the guys in data science have much more complicated methodology, but that's mine. And I apply that to pretty much every problem I get. Yep. What is the actionable insight? Yep. And if I can't find that, maybe maybe we should spend our time working on something else we can. I hope you guys have notes there because that is literally the holy grail to getting it done. Like, because, and, it, and you know, I know we've got some Splunkers in the room here, right? Splunk is a fantastic tool. I love tool. Splunk. We, we, <laughs> Splunk. We, are, we are all massive fans of Splunk. But it's about what data you put in it. It's about how you ingest that data and what you can then do with that data. If it's just data for data's sake, which unfortunately, there's been a lot of organisations that took a data lake approach to everything. Let's get as much data as we can, pull it into this pipe, and let's see what we can see. Guess what? All you see is a bunch of noise. And then you hire all these analysts, and you throw them eyes on glass, and they go, all I'm seeing is a bunch of noise, guys. Yep. I'm hiring you to do a job. Give me these actionable insights because it's too much data and it's not the right data or whatever the case may be. But that whole value chain of data to information, let's see if I can get this right, data to information, information to insights, insights to actionable insights, and actionable insights to actions. That's, that's the value chain. Yep. Like that's that's huge. The reason why I brought up this, this slide here, and thanks to Marina for putting this together because this is actually what you guys were talking about. A program never stops, right? If, 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 you, if you think of it in the terms of what we're trying to achieve here, it is a program that never stops, right? It's cyclical. You go through each stage and each stage feeds the next stage, but you get so good at it that it becomes business as usual and it doesn't have to be a whole beast of a program. That's another thing that has to be done. If it's done right, what it will do is it will drive that cultural change. Yes. It will drive positive mental attitudes inside the organisation and the byproduct then becomes security. Right? And, and, and security is... Go. I need to quibble with it. Go. Oh, you know. quibble away. <laughs> so, it, like, all of these are important elements, so I'm not going to disagree with that. What I would say is... But again, this focuses on very you know, quite tactical and operational issues. What it doesn't capture, and this is something that has got to be really instilled in a lot of these things. I guess these are parts of the program in terms of bringing personnel on board and managing throughout the life cycle, sure. Mm -hmm. What doesn't it capture? It doesn't capture the things that Ron was just talking about. Mm -hmm. What if the organisation is just really doing a terrible job of running its IT operations? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an insider risk, isn't it? It is. It's because those, For those, sure. those decisions are all made internally. Yep. And if management and leadership are not making adequate risk-based decisions and they're not recording those things or they're not saying, yes, we understand that there is a level of risk acceptance here, but we justify it or not, then that creates the problems that everything else in here cannot For solve. sure. So let me ask you a question then. You said, if management do or don't do, what is the definition in the way, in the context that you were just talking, what is management? Who are management? Well, we'll go back to the government's point. So yep. ultimately this only and really solely comes down to where accountability sit, and accountabilities are all about how decisions are made in an organisation. Mm -hmm. If a decision is or is not made by anybody who's got the authority to do so within an organisation, and then that has a flow and effect of creating risk, particularly when they've been notified, like there's a risk here mm -hmm. that if we don't do this or if we do this, then X, Y, Z are the outcomes. Yep. And then somebody in that circle there does something that realises that risk. Whose fault is it really? And if you're not really pulling back on that and saying, well, the root cause of this was that this was a possibility and somewhere up the chain, a decision was made that allowed this to happen. Yep. If all you're going to do is smack the person that was at the other end of their keyboard, exactly. that's not going to work. Exactly. So we're back to the very first point 
which is it's got to start at the top. It's culture. It's got to be culture that changes from the top. You don't change culture from the bottom. You change it from the bottom, the top, the side, both sides and the middle and all the way around. It's got to be everyone's <coughs> responsibility. Everyone's culture has to change. And if the CEO is not engaged in that conversation of changing culture, it won't happen because you will have a stakeholder in the food chain that will stop it because it's not in their agenda. It's not in their motivation. It's not one of their priority action tasks that they have to deliver on and that they're KPI'd on, more importantly, right? Because the bigger the organization, the more KPIs, the more all this kind of mess gets in the way. And someone says, not my responsibility, guys. I need this to happen. It's going to happen. And then, boom, the whole organization gets hit. And I would say in our practice, we've found it uh, challenging for practitioners within organisations and ourselves as consultants trying to provide advice to capture the attention of senior decision makers in an organisation. Um, what we have found is that practitioners get to a bit of a ceiling and then either no one understands the concepts and the language they're putting forward, or if you get to a senior level, they perhaps don't understand the vernacular of what a protective security, I suppose, apparatus can provide them in terms of assurance for their organisation. Mm -hmm. Now, I agree with you, this is, a, I suppose, a subset artefact of a, of, a, of, a, of a much larger enterprise problem across risk, there's no doubt about that. But the reality is, and one of the things we've spoken about really today, is trying to get that CEO buy-in to understand the significance of what this offers. I would suggest to you that the risk management program under SOCI uh, and as the literature from uh, Home Affairs says, it should capture pretty much a, a bunch of things that organisations are doing. But to actually wrap that together in a coherent way so that you've got a value proposition to take to a board, to a CEO, to a whatever, who can then conceptualise, there's a benefit here. This allows me to potentially harness and harvest benefits from things we're already doing and try and amalgamate them in a slightly different way, perhaps, to realise additional benefits. Mm -hmm. that, that's a real challenge going forward. All of us in this room and online are inevitably going to face. Yep. The thing about Socky is it gives us a catalyst now for that discussion for, again, the stakeholders that we're representing today, which gives us that path to have that discussion. Mm -hmm. that will be a subsequent activity we, we look into. Absolutely. Do you know the, the big challenge that I kind of confront talking to CEOs on one level and boards and then security professionals on another, they, they speak totally different languages. Language, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and language is and, wrong. And you, you get a presentation on IPA, API management, for example, and then you get the bill and you're like, how, how would a CEO or a board be able to make a decision? So I think you're right, Tim. How, how do you actually say, here's the value that we could add and here's how much it costs. If you want to do more, this is how much it costs and here's the benefit you get. I don't get a sense that, that we're quite at that stage. And you walk into an organisation, <coughs> and I might choose yours, like MBM, you can just see the excitement of, of, of you and Darren, and you know exactly what everyone's doing. You can go to every individual team, mm -hmm. and, and you can't write an instrument that says, be curious, be inspirational, no. take an interest in staff. <laughs> but you kind of want to, right? Like, I'd love to do that if people wanted to, that'd be fine. But, but I think that's at the core of it. There's such a disconnect, yeah. and culture is so much part of it. Yeah, for sure. And I think also, you know, having a conversation with a CEO or a board member about <coughs> something very technical, like vulnerability management, insider threat, access and identity management, data and analytics, you know, these types of um, concepts without turning that into a into a risk or something that's very easy. You know, CEOs and board members talk the language of risk. That's mm -hmm. the only language yep. to talk. Business case and benefits. Um, yep. That's it. Yep. And if you're having those conversations and people aren't responding, <laughs> It's almost certainly because the language or the, the concept is wrong from the technologists or from the yeah. risk people. And, yeah. and that's that, you know, that if I could fix one thing, it would be fixing <clears throat> that because I think that would fix well, that's, everything. That, that's my industry's fault, yep. right? Like that's, that's the vendors yep. over 20 years inventing language to make us look like we're the smartest people in the room. That's literally how it's come about. I think the industry does it within itself, though. So I, I yeah, think yeah, you've got to simplify the conversation. Oh, 100%. Coming, coming to the, the infosec side of events years ago from the physical side, the first thing I've said was you've just got to simplify it. Yeah. Mm. See, see on boards and nickel too. It's another business risk. Simplify it. Don't exaggerate it. If you're up there competing for money with sales, you've got to be pragmatic. <coughs> this is a business risk. If we do this, mm -hmm. we will reduce this risk. Mm -hmm. So at any point in the 
within an AT, someone can make a decision on risk, right? Yep. So your risk has to stack up against the health and safety risk, yep. commercial risk, and finance risk. Yep. So you, the modern security leader has got better speak in common tongue. Yep. And that's the, if you can be that, that conduit and that translator, that's the success. Yeah, that's right. We've had this um, very same problem at NAN. And I would challenge that if we asked everybody in this room what does insider risk mean, you would get a thousand different answers. Yes, and, you and would. So you've got your different people that are managing insider risk across uh, across the bank, all talking upwards. The CEO is bound to be confused, completely befuddled as to what is going on in this in this space. So, insider risk can be that you you know half of your team have called in sick because of COVID, and therefore can't deliver on some critical service. It could also be that somebody uh, is trying to penetrate the critical infrastructure from within. Um, they're two very different. Things. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've tried to simplify our language by identifying that all, all everything that touches or has anything to do with an insider has an element of risk attached to it. Mm -hmm. um, not negligence, not or malicious. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be completely accidental, whatever it is. Um, uh, sorry, not malicious, but potentially negligent. Um, could be outsmarted as well. Could be outsmarted by an external organisation. But there's all every single thing in the organisation that has a person attached to it has an element of insider risk. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the other end of the scale, you've got your criminal event. And that's where we're, um, I mean, my my area of interest is on the crime, obviously, uh, where, where an event of a criminal nature has occurred. And what is in the middle is then the insider threat. So yes. trying to amass the person, the threat is the person who is a threat to the organisation of creating some sort of harm. So going from risk to event, requires that threat. Without mm -hmm. that threat, the event would never happen. That's right. That's the nature of insider, obviously. It makes sense. So um, trying to get that common language internally has been a real challenge. I'm mm -hmm. still not entirely there yet. Yep. But I think, you know, across every industry that would be the case. And, yep. and, and talking from industry to industry, <coughs> it would be the case of what insider threats. So many people just immediately think of some sort of cyber uh, issue. Yes. Um, which, which is fine if that's how you define it in your organisation, but we're trying to put it that way to say the insider themselves, the employee who has that intent, is the threat. Yep, and I would I would um, suggest that we start talking about culture much more mm -hmm. because the second every CEO and every board member understands culture. What what a good culture means to the organisation. A good culture means we have great people. We have people who love coming to work. We have less churn. We have less staff turnover. We have, you know, happier people mean happier customers. It's it's pretty straightforward if you think of it that way, because then the byproduct of that great culture is a more secure organisation and a less risky one, right? You're still gonna get the bad apple here or there, but they stick out like a sore thumb then. Um, and like, I want to touch on, you know, giving people takeaways from today. Like, I want to touch on, <clears throat> in a bank or a telco, you've got multiple stakeholders just within security, let alone outside of security, right? And so, you know, where do you stand up the function is a big, big question mark for a lot of organisations. And the answer isn't it needs to sit in cyber or not sit in cyber or sit in crime, financial crime or not financial crime. That's not the question. The question is, is it a cross-functional role? Does it cut across multiple? Because <clears throat> it, then it doesn't matter where it sits. Like, do you want to sp speak a little bit about that, Ben? Because I yeah, know so going through, you've been going through that, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we, went, we went through a few different um, models, but uh, obviously you could sit it in your... Uh, enterprise security functions, you can sit it in your people and culture functions. We've landed in the risk function. We said that this is where it sits, but we run a uh, insider crime forum um, and there's three people that, well, I chair it, but there's three members that all have an equal vote on it. One is our people and culture uh, executive, one is my risk executive, and one is a, a government, a, an independent governance executive. And, and from the three of them, decisions are made that will affect the enterprise when it comes to insider risk. 
Now, in that forum, we have members from all across the organisation, so our people in culture, our data loss people, our, our identity access uh, people, our um, market surveillance or insider trading people, uh, our insider crime, they're, they're all represented in the forum, mm -hmm. uh, but the governance comes from these three decision makers uh, and then myself as the chair. Um, because it does affect the entire organisation, and that's where if you sit it in one spot or another spot, ultimately it probably doesn't really matter if you've got the right um, governance, governance structure, structure in place. That's right. Um, but there is no single home. Uh, MITRE do put recommendations in what they think, and they, they uh, I, from memory, sorry if I'm wrong, Jonathan, but from memory I think they actually say that people function should, should run these because it's a risk of the people. We sat it in the risk function um, because it's the risk of our people, I suppose. Um, but they're quite clear that it, it shouldn't sit in enterprise security. Um, not right. that any of those answers are wrong, yep. um, but you've just got to, as long as you've got the right. But any of those answers structure. will be wrong if you don't have a cross functional governance right. structure <clears throat> that sits across the top of it. Right, and, and I keep going back to the, the, the CEO needs to be part of that conversation. They need to be part of understanding why that governance structure is that way. And Hamish, I would, you know, uh, Tim and I were talking about this the other day. You know, what we would like to try and do, uh, perhaps with your assistance and maybe some other higher ups, is to engage and do a roadshow like this, maybe not for as long a duration, but for CEOs to get in the room and have this conversation about people and culture and the risk of not doing something about your people and culture with this socky lens on, right? Because if we can get them engaged, Zoe's role becomes much easier, right? Because when you hit that roadblock and you, in, it's inevitable you'll hit that roadblock from a stakeholder in the business somewhere who is too busy with their own priorities, and you can't really fault them for that. That's what they're hired for. That's what they're KPI'd on. That's what they're going to be focused on. But when that roadblock comes, you need the CEO to be able to talk down or talk around and find a solution. That's the CEO's role in a company, is to find a solution to whatever comes up. All right? And so, you know, I, I would like to kind of put an action item out there on everybody that's attending today to go and have that discussion internally and see if there is a glass ceiling in your organisation. Do you hit a glass ceiling when you try to have this conversation all the way up top? I would be really interested to hear what the percentage of folks coming back and saying, I got to the CEO. I'd really love to have, hear that. And you know, we're gonna put another one of these on, we'll get to this in next steps. We're gonna put another one of these on in March. We decided March is the right time frame. hopefully, this session here will help people start that crawl motion, getting started, governance, right? Making sure it's cross-functional is the first, first piece of that puzzle before we get to the next items. Um, and then if, if, if we've been able to make that crawling function, then we will help to engage those CEOs right across the spectrum, right across critical infrastructure. That's how we're gonna lift capability across the country. That's how our national security goes up. There's no other way to do it other than collaborating and making this effort where we can all kind of say the right things and sing from the same hymn sheet. One language I think all CEOs uh, understand is money. Uh, and it doesn't matter which, um, I suppose, review of inside threats, cyber security and so on that you look at over the last you know, five, six, ten years, whatever, um, the unintentional insider comes up as the majority offender. So anywhere between 50-something and 70-something percent in any of these surveys, mm -hmm. the unintentional insider. And so when we're talking about uh, investments in an organisation in their workforce that are already in existence, what are you putting your money into? You're putting money into training and education. So the unintentional insider suggests there's a low-hanging fruit, if you like, in terms of how you're actually educating your staff about the security uh, performance, behaviours, whichever label you would like to put on it. Uh, how are you doing it? Because if you are doing a better job of educating them, which again goes to the culture point, that investment that's extant, perhaps redirected, has a very chance to get your unintentional insider, the bulk of insider security risk events, below 50% and maybe drive it down even further. So there's a, a value for money type proposition there that's you know, just the, the first idea you might start mm -hmm. to build from. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. 
we, we've heard from a number of um, industry organisations. Brie, I'd, I'd love to touch on because we've got a lot of people joining in the room and online that are from government organisations. I'd love to hear, you know, in the early stages of what you were trying to accomplish from a government organisation perspective, what were the big hurdles that were hard for you to kind of deal with? Um, okay. So in, in no, no particular order. Yep. So one of the biggest hurdles was industrial relations. Mm. So it was this mm. concept of you're spying on me. Mm. Yep. It was where do you find that balance and, and how do you address that? Mm. You need the trust of the employees. They do all the work. So how do you not lose that trust but help protect them from themselves as well? So that, that was one of the biggest hurdles. And in anything that we tried to do, it was always front and centre. So... A big Is that because with? people thought you were conducting like a pseudo surveillance? The automatic assumption is you're looking for a reason to dismiss me. Mm -hmm. And that's not what, the, not what our intent was. And from the work that we've done, that's never occurred. So, but that's the, a, a mindset and culture mm -hmm. of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And you do need to find the right way to implement it so that very sensitive information does not get in the wrong hands. Mm -hmm. um, Another one, we came around, and again, the traditional model of IT is that it's a group that sits on the side, normally in the basement, and they do the IT and the cyber stuff. It's not the rest of the business, is it, in that issue. Again, that comes to, you need to find who's the sponsor. And ideally, you want it to be the CEO. Mm -hmm. You want the CEO to be your sponsor, be your champion, say, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it, not the IT manager or the CIO or whatever label you want to put on, not the, the, the geeky technical person. If they're the sponsor, then everybody, people tend to switch off and say it's just another IT thing. You need the business to be the sponsor. Mm -hmm. And ideally, the, the CEO or multiple sponsors throughout the business itself so that it's ingrained in what you do. Mm -hmm. If you don't get that sort of buy-in, you know, you really are running up your from day one as well. Mm -hmm. So just quick reflection, those are the two biggest things. Yep. And so, and I know maybe it's the... Uh, uh, the stigma of being government it doesn't move as fast mm. so you talk about you know the ceo's money is the big thing in government it's not always about how much money you're spending mm -hmm. it's the outcome you're looking for mm -hmm. so you, you need to find what those other triggers are which are important but balanced uh, again the other comment you can't be the sky is falling either mm -hmm. because that won't get it either so yep. you need a balanced argument the right terminology the right sponsors yep and, and then working through those things for the organization that you're in yep the, the first one's really interesting, what you said, the, you know, are we spying on people? Uh, and I know we went through this conversation with you as well, uh, Simon, right, in the early days. It's like the only one way to overcome that problem is great communication. And great communication isn't just, here's what we're doing. This is the program that we're delivering. It's, this is what we're not doing. And this is why. You know, one of the one of the things that we always try and kind of touch on is right now the organization is hoovering up all of this information. Most of it's never going to be useful. Some of it isn't useful for security at all, but we still hoover it up. Let's get better at how we choose the right data, protect that data, to <laughs> understand what's happening without infringing on privacy. And getting that right and explaining very clearly why we're doing it, what the outcomes are, what the outcomes are not, and what we're not capturing, that's just as important as well. I don't know if anyone's got You've any... You've got to avoid fear as well, for start, yeah. because pe people who don't know what's happening are going to be more fearful. That's people right. People are told, here's what we're doing, here's the rationale. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we have seen examples of some people using Soki to, to roll out a surveillance program and oh, yeah. stuff. Oh, and, sure. and so that is completely against the ethos of what it's trying to do. In fact, arguably unlawful, but but really I think that shows you where trust is broken down. 100%. And, and that's what everyone's got to avoid. 100%. And, and people have to be on the journey together. 100%. I mean, actually, back to the issue of money, <laughs> except for in the government where it's we're a drain on, on money, I know, I know, but we're doing it, we're doing it in the national interest. But actually, it, it can be a much more profitable um, enterprise. I don't know, Ben, if you think about things in terms of profit and how much you're making that, yeah, well, we um, the way I look at the, the cost of anything to do with the insider threat is it's just another cost per person 
So 34,000 employees, you've got your cost and you divide it by 34,000 and it's that per person to run our program. And we already invest a lot of money in doing um, pre-screening, probity checks and things like that. That costs a lot of money, getting criminal history checks on every employee mm -hmm. that comes into the organisation. We then provide our employees with laptops and phones and um, and, and space to work in. And there's a, there's a lot of ongoing costs that come with having any employee. Mm -hmm. And this actually represents just a tiny little bit of extra to help manage the risk of that employee. And that's that's the way that I've been approaching the, the overall cost of any program. And that so far seems to be getting me where I want to go, but mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm not saying that it's, it's, it's the answer for everyone. Um, but we're, we're also quite fortunate in that our CEO, when he joined a week after me, uh, three years ago, um, he put in a twin pillars strategy of uh, everything's about our colleagues and our customers. And all of our work pins to either our colleagues or our customers. Mm, and he was good. asked on day one with this strategy, there's nothing in there about financing. And he said, no, if you take care of the colleagues and the customers, your finances will take care of themselves which I thought was That's a really good, good, That's um, really good. Uh, direction to go in. And of course, colleagues being one of our primary pillars, well, we're helping manage the risk of those, employees, those colleagues so that the 33,990 really, really good ones are protected against the 10 bad ones. So. Um, so that's sort of the way that we approach, uh, where we're approaching it from a financial point. You know the other aspect that, that we're seeing, both in government, but, but I'm sure in the private industry as well, is an added requirement from staff to have a lateral movement, to have their own careers, and for us to be more actively engaged. And I think that really goes to the whole way you manage people. Mm -hmm. And getting back to the idea of an engaged workforce, an engaged mm -hmm. employer, mm -hmm. how, how do we change that and create a better culture? <laughs> mm -hmm. So that security is really important, and, and that's kind of why we're here. But actually, staff are at the heart of everything. Totally. And, and a more engaged workforce <coughs> is profitable, has better security outcomes, and it's just fundamentally a better place to work. Yep. And, and so what we're really focused on right now is trying to, trying to get every employer to see and to understand that if you put these things and if your your staff and your team feels trusted, respected, protected, valued, they will absolutely deliver the best outcome for your organisation that you could possibly ever imagine. So if you just focus on that, the byproduct is secure. It's just a byproduct. Right. We are having a clash of generations and different oh, yeah. of workforce. Well, the, well, it's all, all things we got to deal with. Yeah. Well, but, okay. So you guys have all heard of the mass resignation or whatever they call it, right? Like the Great Resignation. This is in in the US. This is huge, right? Like the big tech companies, the big banks, not, the not big pharma that, not companies. I'm sure. Like, <laughs> well, no. I mean, it's it, it's it's a huge problem for everybody, right? And you know, it's because those staff don't feel those things. They either don't feel protected, they don't feel trusted, they don't feel respected, or whatever the case may be. That's why they don't want to work there. But then, then you get back to Ben's point, you say every single staff member costs this. It's more expensive to onboard people. That's why we're having a more mobile workforce. We really need more mobile in security and personnel security. Right? Yeah. And that's a fundamental challenge. For sure. Well, let's sure. just pick up on that bit too, because you know you started this conversation by saying, "Where are we going to find all these people?" Uh huh. We've created our own skills crisis <laughs> in security, right? Yes. By being very narrow in our perception uh -huh. of what would make a good security person. Uh huh. I, I don't have an IT background. I studied international relations, and I was always told, "You know, you're never going to get a job doing that." Well. <laughs> I mean, you're not going to get a job doing a Look whole lot. Look at me now, Mum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit of that. But, you know, we've got this entire cohort of students that exist in business disciplines, humanities disciplines, mm -hmm. a multitude of disciplines. Yep. Uh, um, the team I hired at MBN, that incredibly diverse and multi outstanding team really outstanding team and i think that was by and large because i hired for attitude you know the things that hamish just called out mm -hmm. i want somebody with curiosity and we enthusiasm, do. All of these yeah. things. so you know that 
<laughs> it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you mm -hmm. think you need to hire somebody that's going to fit into a box of what you think is perfect, then you're fitting that person who eventually comes into the role into a box before they even get there. And then you're going to be surprised that their work satisfaction tanks after a little mm -hmm. while and they go somewhere else. Yep. 100% agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, it, like, you've got to be better at this. And this is why I always say at the heart of the way, well, certainly that I approach security while I was working on it from an operational side, the way I approach it now and the way I approached it as a leader, you've got to start with empathy. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't have empathy for both the, the colleagues around you, I like that distinction of the, the colleagues and customers. Yeah, that's really good. Because what does that do? It forces empathy into your mindset of mm -hmm. how you're going to engage with both of those things. Um, and that's, yeah, it becomes a fundamental part of it. Now, I didn't, I had nobody leave the NBN under my leadership while I was in that role. Um, and that was nearly five years or something like that, which for, you know, generational reasons is often seen as quite an unheard of thing these days. Mm -hmm. But I really just wanted to make sure that they kept feeling challenged and fulfilled. And a big part of that was just saying, got your strengths, I've got mine. Mm -hmm. They're not exactly the same because, frankly, if two people agree 100% of the time, one of them isn't necessary. We need to challenge each other and work together to look at these problems in a multifaceted way yep. and, and grow together from there. I learned so much from my team while I was in that role. Mm. Um, so did I. <laughs> yeah. um, working with them, getting that level of knowledge and insights that they've brought to the party. I've been able to take that now into my public policy work. Mm. Um, you cannot discount how important that kind of mentality is. Mm, for sure. I think adding adding to that of my own experience is, because um, I grew up in a sort of the fraud and financial crime side of banking, and I was always hanging out with cyber people, and the term cyber kind of scared me. I thought, well, I don't really know anything about cyber. I'm going to mm -hmm. ask a technical question here. Or, and so, as part of my master's degree, I did a sub, I selected a subject in cyber, and I didn't realise how much I actually already knew. Um, yeah. It, it, it wasn't this big it's secret. It's just risk. Um, you know, dark room with big screens and mm -hmm. people typing a million miles an hour and mm -hmm. getting into the dark web. It wasn't about that. <laughs> it, I actually knew a lot already, mm -hmm. um, but it had scared me away from having conversations mm -hmm. in the past because mm -hmm. I just thought I didn't. So it, just the term cyber is a scary Yeah, one. for sure. There's so many cyber snobs out there still, though. Yeah. Oh, there is. <laughs> I mean, like, it's pretty it's pretty scary that they still exist. It's across the whole right? industry. So, I mean, yeah. absolutely some great success there, but it's even in the cyber defense team. So if you're all kind of looking at how do I mature the program because everyone's got a program of some sort. Yeah. I'm going to points today. Um, you've got to fish from here. Funnily enough, though, I just realised, just literally realised that of the... 250, 300 people that registered for this event, there are very few cyber people, which is very interesting. That's a, know, just a thought. Um, because I think the narrative is changing. I think the narrative is changing. We're starting to speak better language, more common language that everyone can understand. You know, and to your point, right, what we're hiring for today is attitudes, aptitudes, and soft skills. The rest can be taught. If they've got the right attitude, the right aptitude and the right soft skills and the right EQ to empathy, to your point, then you can teach them the rest of it. And so the vision for the, the, the Insider Risk Centre of Excellence, not to steal Jonathan's thunder, but is like eventually, like we're going through a crawl, walk, run motion as well, but eventually what we want to be able to do is to identify net new talent that don't exist in cyber anywhere and we're not taking cyber people, we're taking people from, I don't know, HR roles or whatever other it's roles. It's not a cyber around. problem, I'm going to change that dial. It's not a cyber problem. It's not a cyber problem, it's a people I'm problem. I'm not surprised you've probably got a lot of people from cyber on the call. It's, you know, if you look at the end to end life cycle, there's yep. people in culture, there's people yep. in security ops. Yep. Some of the best success in the last 12 months is in the SecOps space. Yep. Personnel screening. But yeah. if we ran this event three years ago, it'd be mostly cyber people. I mean, small, we would be a smaller event. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. They were small. I just want to make the analogy to safety. If you look back maybe 10 there or 15 years ago, mm. safety was done by the safety people and it wasn't my problem. Mm -hmm. And But now, True. if you look around every organisation, safety is inherent in everybody's job. Yep. 
Same, for same part. Exactly. So this is just, you know, a few Off health and safety, it, yeah. It did take criminal offences to shut them <laughs> on, though. <laughs> 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 yeah, but you're right. There was, there was legislation. There was lots of, yeah, yeah. you know, a lot, lot of hammers. Well, I think it's, that's where the critical infrastructure legislation helps, right? It yeah. helps that conversation. It Big time. It helps yeah. Big time. Board, and we need, to, we need to get to the same level of safety. Mm. Yeah, mm. Yeah. And we only had to have two criminal offences. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, can I look at workforce from a, a more expansive perspective Please. in terms of the SOCI workforce? One of the things that became apparent to us in some other research last year was the, the shortage, if you like, of STEM qualified people, and that'll that'll be you know, affecting the, the SOCI type respective workforce going forward. And one of the key tenets is there's going to be a lot of migrants coming to Australia that will start to fill these jobs. Our universities will not generate enough Australian citizens, if you like, to fill these jobs. So one of the things that we really started to explore was the criticality of being able to expand the pool of talent at your disposal. And as we've fought through this, we've, we've, we've made a, a very strong, I suppose, investment in understanding that pre-employment part, that suitability part. And, and I'll, I'll use this little ditty, which um, uh, uh, people in the ICT industry sort of say to me, oh, I get it. Um, for instance, you, you might find a person who's not an Australian citizen, so we don't have necessarily a checkable background. Um, there's ways to find out more things about people, I suppose. But, but this person won't fit a vanilla recruitment process for your company. But they've got skills and attributes that you really, really want. Mm -hmm. So by getting the right combination of personality assessment, psychometric testing, whatever you think is right when you work with your HR people and, and others, you can start to say, OK, this person is a bit different, but by goodness, we need them. And they're going to go into a, a critical position. There'll be a critical worker in the, in the SOCI vernacular. Um, the investment that goes up front and the investment in, the, in, the, in their role and the post, I suppose, part, I, I can, I'll leave that to later. But the key point is, to make the most of the human capital available, you need to make that investment up front, both for your operational perspective, but also to support your insider threat or whatever, whatever label you want to put on a program. Because if that person can then have that wrapper around them, they're important enough to your enterprise to have that extra investment, that extra level of understanding. We're getting back to those soft skill issues we spoke about before in terms of well-being and culture. If this person goes off the rails a bit, for want of a better term, then there's a mechanism in place because you've had the discussion with the person, the right wrapper can be put around them. Mm -hmm. I think it was you, Bruce, said before about saving someone from themselves. Um, the issue of a background check, which the SOCI uh, RMPs talk about, um, very important issue. But again, we'd say, OK, if someone has had a criminal event in their life, still need to put that into context. You shouldn't necessarily discount them then and there because of that event. Um, they might have been young. It might have been a totally different type of offence. I mean, if someone's got done for a financial offence and they're going into the banking industry, you know, you might make a judgment there. But if it's quite divorced from what they're going to go and do now when they've grown up and so on. So, so I suppose we're really trying to get to the point, you know, how do you make the most of the human capital on offer yep. and actually use that to enrich your culture and your operations sure. going forward? So there's a security aspect, absolutely, but there's a much broader benefit, I suppose, that can be derived by taking perhaps a more tailored approach. You don't do it for everybody, but for your critical workers, you may well consider that. Yep. That takes me to another interesting thought, that actually, you know, inside a threat, inside a risk management is not new. No. This has been around for ages, right? So in, in the UK, I was living in the UK when uh, the um, CPNI, the Centre for Protection of National Infrastructure, came up with the HOMA guidelines, right? This is, what year was that? 2011. 2011, right? And they were, they were talking about all of this kind of stuff then. In the US, you know, you've, you've had the National Insider Threat Task Force that's been set up for years, right? And, and MITRE has been doing research on this for 20 years, right? Carnegie Mellon's been, been putting stuff out and SEI CERT, people, like, it's a great resource. There's lots of different aspects to this being done but what we see is a lot of it's come out of defense right a lot of like defense has been doing this for a long time the intel community has been doing this for a long time now it's spreading out to critical infrastructure and then it will spread out to smbs as well maybe 10 years from now who knows right but actually that roadmap and following that roadmap is important and right now australian defense and u.s defense are actually focused on continuous vetting, right? Why? Because forever and a day, like however many hundreds of thousands of people get cleared to work for defence or a defence contractor. That clearance process is long, 
arduous, extremely costly, and they're collecting a ton of personal data, which gets stored somewhere and someone's dealing with that. That's a whole other thing. But then you hire them and then you don't check them for another five years or four years or whatever it is before you do a review of that vetting, right? That's completely broken model because people aren't born inside of threats. People change. Their circumstances, you know, and, and different kind of environmental surroundings make them think differently, act differently. People change over time. So that whole following the defense approach where they're at right now doing this, I think in, uh, in the US they're calling it Trusted Workforce 2.0. So by the end of December next year, anybody that's cleared in the, to work with US defense or a defense contractor has to be able to abide by Trusted Workforce 2.0, which means continuous vetting, which is collecting the right data, evaluating that data for behavioral changes, so on and so forth. Now down here, Defence is looking at a very similar type of model. That's going to come down throughout this, you know, but basically what we're talking about with Socky is something extremely similar to that. Absolutely. So we're catching up pretty quickly, you know, whereas before we were, you know, four or five years behind the curve, now we're actually kind of it's joining up in the middle, which is I kind of that's right. encouraging. That's a good example. It's not a cyber problem, right? Yeah. Um, and I think the end to end life cycle and whilst my team has custodianship of the Trusted Insider program. In the last 12 months, it's a SecOps team that's that kind of delivered that, that refresher mm -hmm. training. So that, that that same checks that we did when we got employed is now mandated for certain level roles and certain access across mm. the company. So, and that will happen you know, every couple of years from here on. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. So we've talked about governance and cross-functional discipline. That, that's really, really important. And, and being able to have that executive level visibility to, to, to this type of work and this type of initiative, right? So we've talked about that. We've talked a lot about culture, which is absolutely the most fundamental thing. But for organisations that are actually starting to put these <coughs> programs in place, what are some of the other things that we need to talk about? Like, what, where do you get started? So, okay, you get your governance structure in place, you get the executives briefed, you get their support for starting the program. You then hire your first insider threat leader or trusted insider leader or somebody who's dedicated to this functional work and this capability. What then comes next? Um, you know, for me, the discovery then becomes very important. And discovery is not just collecting data is important. Data, information, insights, <laughs> actionable insights, <laughs> actions is important. But before you get to that, you need to take a programmatic approach, which is about people, processes, and policies. Wonder if any of you guys could touch on, you know, what's the right way to approach the, the policies and the procedural bits, right? There, because there'd be a there'd be a crack at something I found really useful. Then I'll I'll ask you to maybe comment on it. <laughs> totally set up. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, one of the things that. Um, that I got shown a couple of years ago, and I've I've found this a super useful tool, uh -huh. really useful tool, and it's something that um, I understand AWS does, and it it's along the lines. You, you're about to start something inside a thread, whatever it is. As the senior leader in charge, you write a like a press release of your service, like it was already done. Like, what's this going to look like? What's it going to do? What, what are the really cool things? It, it, it's sort of a little bit of fantasy. You make it up kind of thing. And and I've, I've done that a few times with a few things like this. And I find it absolutely incredibly useful um, for myself and, and also getting my team to do these types of things as well. Mark, is it an AWS thing? Does it work? Uh, yeah, it is actually an AWS thing. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, it's... Uh, it's it's effectively sort of an AWS version of writing the uh, if you were writing a, a strategy, the desired objectives, all that sort of right. Thing. So that it's an AWSification of that. Um, so you write it as a press release, but uh, you know it's fundamentally the the same foundational thinking. Um, the first thing I did uh, when I came into the role was really take stock, all right, where is everything at right now? Mm. Uh, and then you know, 
did an assessment on the basis of that. How, um, how did you do that, though? Well, it Take was, stock of where, where things are at right now. Yeah, so what are the things that are currently in place? What are the things that are currently being emphasised? What is the organisation's understanding of what inside threat actually is? Um, yeah, it was basically following the intelligence life cycle. If the intelligence life cycle, we start with a set of requirements. Then from requirements, you go through to collection. From collection, you go through to analysis and processing. From analysis and processing, you have the production element. And then, you know, the process sort of kicks off again. You feedback loops, cycle continues. When you Sorry, when you say intelligence life cycle, I know you've, done intel, you've been in the intelligence agencies before. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Okay, got it. Got yeah. It. Um, so that's the, the commonly used model when you talk about intelligence as a, a life cycle. So it was really just going back to the beginning point, do we have a set of requirements? And the answer is no. Um, you know, the, if the requirement is, oh, we need an inside of threat program, it's not actually a requirement. That's just jumping straight into what you think is the solution to a problem you mm -hmm. haven't actually defined. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really that case of, right, we need to genuinely start from scratch, assess the current state of things, get a good sense of well, where there are gaps, where there aren't gaps, you know, the maturity of things like policies, but it's also in processes, you know, just getting a fundamental baseline understanding across the board of everything that was sort of going on and revolves around inside the threat as a concept, which is pretty much the entirety of the organisation. It captures mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. um, so we started from there and it was really you know, quite a straightforward process then after a, a few weeks in. Um, I put together this strategy to Simon that was basically a proposal and said this is what I think we need to do. Uh, and it didn't refer to inside a threat at all. Um, it referred to insights. Uh, that's, that was the original mm. name mm -hmm. of, the, of the team. It was about insights. Um, and it was intelligence and insights, if I remember something correctly. Like that, something yeah. like that, um, And that was yeah, sort of a two-pronged thing. There was the intelligence part of it because, yes, we sort of had to acknowledge that, yeah, 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 we're looking for threats and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but the insights part was the bit I really wanted to emphasise because we would talk about that as being threat neutral. You know, we're not really focusing on the monitoring and surveillance aspects yes. of these things. We're looking for the context around mm -hmm. everything else that's going on. We have this entire security function surrounding us. What information can we gain from them to say, okay, we understand that identity and access management is an issue for X whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Well, let's test this. So we would take samples of personnel. We would look at the process overall. We would say, is something from Okta matching up to something that's in AD? And we would really break it down at that, that process and procedural level and then take it back a step further and say, well, what, what does the policy refer to? And with regard to this, is this being managed in alignment to the policy? Oh, look at that. It's not actually mentioned. So I just want to pause there. Don't lose your train of thought, but checking if your policy is actually up to date to actually police the things that you're setting up to police is a big part of it, yeah. right? If you haven't set a policy and and explained and communicated to people why that policy is there and why it matters, then I don't know how you start a program like this. So if your policy is shelfware and not a living document, it's pointless. Yes. Yeah. Um, so and they are mostly shelfware. They are. Much, yeah. I, I will say, I, I guarantee you, without even having talked to the audience, I guarantee you more than 70% of the, of the audience, their policies have not been updated in the last 12 months. Yeah. Or read properly. Or read properly. Because they're kind of boring, right? Well, yeah. they are. Because we haven't <laughs> matured our approach for stuff. Like, well, why do you read? Sure. Because you're interested in that. You don't sure. read policies. Yeah. yeah. Our starting point was to go through our policies that we already had. And as a theme, they were about 80%, you know, there anyway. We had a slight tweak in the policies. Mm. And then we went through a program of re-educating everybody in the organisation. These are the policies. Mm. Here's a reminder of what you signed up for and, you know, what we can do in terms of collecting information. We've given you a company infrastructure. Yep. This is what it means. 
they're giving you access to the internet. This is what it means. <laughs> that was our first step, was reviewing the policies and yeah. re-educating everybody on the policies yeah. before we actually started. And that, that's what Socky's doing. This gives you the opportunity to do that process. You said it before, training is once a year and it, <laughs> people click to the end. Why don't you do it every day? Five seconds every day, you know, uh -huh. a question before you log in. I mean, yeah. I think we've got to think about how you make policies real. Well, that's how, what, how, well, how that's do you actually make Exactly, it and that's, I know Bruce does it, I know Simon does it, I know Min does it, I, and I know that Ran came up with teachable moments, right? So when you identify, so cut in at any point in time if I'm overstepping. <laughs> Um, but like to be able to understand the common mistakes that everyone's making and categorize them to say, okay, here's all the mistakes that people are making across our environment on a regular basis. Here's the top 10 most common ones. And because there's the most common, that represents the biggest risk and the one we can tackle straight away. So the next time somebody does that thing, send them an email, <coughs> tap them on the shoulder. Explain to them, oh, we saw you do that. We know it wasn't intentional or whatever the case may be. Because if it was intentional, that's mm. malicious, then you know it's a different kind of escalation path. But if it's not, and you understand that intent, the second you tap on it, you say, oh, shit, yeah, yeah. okay, all I, right. I, I agree. Most policies get boring. Um, they're too long. They are often used as policing documents, like we'll write it down here, so if you do it wrong, we can hit you with a stick. Mm -hmm. um, Policies are one of the first things I look to change the, the organisation, or at least ref, refresh, refresh yeah. look at and see if they're practical, if they're, just, if they're interesting and if they're adding value. Mm -hmm. um, and the teachable moments kind of approach, I'm not, I'm not sure I invented it, but it, it's really just about giving people context on on what they can do today to make things better. And like, like Hamish said, like, if that's a pop-up every day on their screen about some little snippet that's interesting and not used as, um, as a sort of a stick, I, I think that's cool. Mm. If, if instead of um, um, bailing people up for sending a, a or PowerPoint templates to their personal address <laughs> after it's already happened, if, if you know, if um, a teacher moment might be that a, a screen flashes up and goes, hey, this looks like our IP. Are you sure you want to send it to your personal address? Um, yes, I do. Well, then, then, then send it. But, but at, least, um, at least you've got the opportunity and you've got a teachable moment at the point you chose to do that. Correct. You know, I also think it's more practical. Mm -hmm. I think you'll find uh, for a lot of organisations that haven't set up an insider risk program that there is no insider risk policy. To begin with, mm -hmm. and that there'll be um, elements in the 4,000 other policies yeah. that exist in the bank, your information security policy, your mm -hmm. HR policies, your bribery and corruption policies, they all exist with elements in them. Um, but, and you don't necessarily want to replace all of those either, but having a, an overarching insider risk policy with a set of principles uh, that refer to these other things mm -hmm. is a really good place to start. I am so glad you said that. So, uh, if you guys go to um, insiderthreat.mitre.org, you will find guiding principles. Right. Those guiding principles is what, so when we formed a partnership with MITRE, we were asked to sign up to those guiding principles and they and they guide everything that we do and shape everything that we do. It's simple, but it's so effective and so important. Sorry to cut you off. I just no, 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 I was done. Trying to get, trying to get as many takeaways for, for these folks as, as possible. No. Uh, there's a number of questions on the line I, as well. Yeah. Sure. We've got half an hour left, so right. that's probably perfect timing. Yes. So we have a question. How can a mature trusted insider program re reduce supply chain risk? Ah, interesting, interesting question. Supply chain risk. So how can, so the question for those who didn't hear it is how can a trusted insider program help reduce supply chain risk? Um, anyone want to kick that off? I mean, I've, I've got lots I can say on that, but anybody? Well, I think supply chain is one of those um, elements of risk that it's a lot bigger than something that just sits at the operational level. Mm -hmm. and we've seen that throughout the last couple of yep. years in a way that I don't think anybody's expecting to all happen at once mm -hmm. uh, during our lifetimes. But, you know, we've had pandemics, um, 
unprecedented uh, you know, catastrophic weather events that are becoming increasingly precedented. And, you know, we've had um, the outbreak of hostilities in Ukraine. Uh, now, those things all have an impact in some way or another on supply chain elements. There is the geopolitical mm -hmm. element at all times. Mm -hmm. uh, those are not things that a any singular organization can necessarily control for, and they're certainly not something that an insider program can really do anything about. But where you start to see the direct relevance between uh, elements of your supply chain, particularly with the parties, then yes, that becomes extremely mm -hmm. relevant straight away. Um, the, the first thing is, you know, trusted suppliers, you need to understand who the entity is mm -hmm. at large, uh, have that foundational understanding of their company structures, mm -hmm. um, who, uh, who are on the board, and uh, who has uh, executive decision-making authority, all of those kind of mm -hmm. Then you obviously go the next layer down. Well, what does working with this entity actually look like? Is it within my risk appetite? Is it within my risk appetite? What will it give them access to, whether mm -hmm. it's a physical facility, whether it's our information and systems, mm -hmm. is it any of our critical systems, et cetera? Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, you really just need to apply the exact same lens that you would apply to anything that already existed within your organisation, because once they're on board, they're basically your staff mm. uh, in terms of how you need to consider them from a, a risk perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's exactly right. They're just an extension of your team. Yeah, they are an extension of your team. Yep. Um, and that you know goes for anything. It goes for remote access staff. It goes for any of your you know IT supply chain that's based overseas. If mm -hmm. they've got access to your systems, they're your staff. So yep. you need to think about it like that. Yeah. Uh, that's really all it comes down to. Yeah, I mean, related to the SOC RMP, when we talk about supply chain, uh, there's six elements that are expressed uh, in the materials, and well, four of those are personnel security related. Mm -hmm. uh, I just might ask Adesh, who has got unique experience in supply chain, would you want to make a couple of comments on that? Um, yeah, so just quickly, so, so my, name, my name's Adesh, so I'm one of um, Tim's uh, colleagues and boss at work. Uh, but I've got a lot of experience in specifically supply chain security. And just to further Tim's point, yes, under under the RMPs in SOCI, um, there are six components um, for that, all directly relate into the purely security perspective that absolutely overlaps with a lot of the personal based security discussion that's been uh, brought up by the panel today. And there are two in there that aren't really directly security related, but more relate to operational supply chain uh, operational supply chain matters. So that uh, component of meeting the supply chain uh, requirements of SOCI is a little bit nuanced. But to go to this point, supply chains in any organisations can be complex or they can be, you can have a lot of certainty over the influence of control that an organisation can, um, can exert over the supply chain or there can be less uh, confidence over the control that can be exerted over. Some supply chains are intranational, some are international, and depending on the context of it, there are naturally going to be a lot more moving parts and dynamic bits that makes assessing the risk to that are quite different. Now, the, the good the good news is, is a lot of the principles that are being discussed here can actually be applied within that context. Pe people within um, how you manage the risk from uh, insiders within any organisation will absolutely influence risks that can present in one supply chain within an organisation. You can export some of those principles depending on what the supply chain looks like outside of that. Um, but there are a lot more moving parts once you get into complex supply chain that involve uh, third parties, multi-suppliers, transnational uh, movement of goods across supply chain. So it's a lot more depth what I don't think we can cover here. Yeah. But there certainly is solving the solving the problems that you've been discussing here, Mo, and the panel in here is absolutely a good grounding to solve many of the other aspects of the security problem For sure. that we're talking about here. Yeah, because it's a people problem. Absolutely. It's all about people, right? And cybersecurity has left the people to last. Like I don't know I don't understand how we ended up here. But absolutely if you put the people at the centre of it you can solve all of the security issues as best as possible by putting the people at the centre of it. Um, and I know that for those of you that are concerned about supply chain security requirements for the RMPs, um, 
Providence is going to do an event specifically early next year on supply chain risk. Um, so that's something that you guys all might be might, might be interested in, but a, a, a very good question. Uh, any other questions? Yes, we have another one. Uh, thank you for this afternoon. There is a lot to take on. Are you able to look at the top three, five initiatives that will just help me to start on the top of all? Yeah, I think we've I think we've gone through um, a number of those. I wrote down, you know, for, for me, you know, the, the first thing is it's got to be programmatic, right? So programmatic to me means that it needs to involve people, process, um, and technology. It's not a technology issue. I think we've heard that time and time again. It's a cultural issue, and, and we've got to think about that. So, you know, first and foremost for me is, and I'm happy to be challenged, I'm happy to take any anybody else's thoughts and feedback, but for me, it's executive stakeholder engagement and getting the governance right, and it has to be cross-disciplinary, it has to be cross-functional. Um, then when you start to think about a team to run it, it has to be, you have to have someone, at least one individual who's dedicated to the function, uh, and they have to be cross-cutting as well. They cannot be stovepiped in one area of the business and not be able to engage meaningfully with the rest of the business. And then there's the discovery phase, right? So in that discovery phase, it's all the things that Min was talking about Ran was also talking about. Uh, it's where you start to get into the data, but it's also about the discovery of the policies that exist, the communications, the understanding, right? You know, what does our organisation understand? When we talk about what's their understanding, it's not just the employees, it's the board members, it's middle level management, uh, it's the, the ex -co, it's all of them. You know, what's their understanding? Um, and I think if, if, if those are the things that organisations start to address first, and start to address now, today, then the reason why we thought we would do a follow-on to this in March is it gives people three to four months to actually get that done. And that actually can be done in three months. Regardless of your shape or size, you can do that piece. Getting the governance structure set up, thinking about the right person to hire, thinking about where that should be functionally based and starting the discovery process so that when we come back together in March, like you should have a bunch of issues you've hit, right? That's very interesting point, Mo, because uh, I think thinking about soccer legislation is something new. Uh, we already have a precedent in Australia with the leading policy in protective security, which is protective security policy framework, which is Australian government agencies were required to implement for a number of years. Correct. Uh, being in AGD at the time in 2018, when it moved from compliance-based to principle and risk-based, I've been observing, you know, lots of government entities struggling how to move from the compliance tick box exercise to we need to think about risk environment. And there are a couple of observations which resonated what the panel was talking about, uh, how to get attention of CEOs, of secretaries, etc., mm -hmm. where security is siloed in the uh, in the corner, and how to get the traction, you know, from the budget. And I think we've been discussing some techniques around it. However, the most efficient uh, way was for people to get together as a community of practices yes. around that and started to discuss it. Great. It would actually help. So uh, being in a GD at the time, we created multiple communities of practices. What worked when we started to do chief security officer forums, when there were education piece, where it was people getting together and trying to understand, okay, these are our new responsibilities. This is the way we can think about it. Yes, absolutely. And that, I'm glad you mentioned community of practitioners. That is definitely one of the foundational pillars that we have for the Insider Risk Centre of Excellence. We want to turn that into a community of practitioners. So not just a community of interest, people that are interested in it, those that are actually doing this work that can come together and help each other out and creating that forum and that, that mechanism for us to share ideas and thoughts. So that's 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 really, really good. So hopefully... I'm just going to... Go. I was just going to take the opportunity to do a little bit of a plug for Tizen, actually. Oh, please, go for uh, it. Because under... So for any critical infrastructure providers who are not yet a member of the Tizen, so I am, as I said before, one of the chairs of the... Sorry, uh, Tizen is the Trusted Information Sharing Trusted. Network. Uh, in co-chairing the uh, data sector group, which we've obviously just stood up this year with the new legislation, all of the 11 sectors will have their own group. 
Uh, and one of the initiatives that we've taken on board uh, within the data sector group is to come up with communities of practice for critical infrastructure providers to do exactly that, address these fundamental strategic issues that are shared across mm -hmm. sectors. Mm -hmm. um, so just a, a call out there that if you're not involved, please get involved. Great. And, 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 and you need more information in the room, Carla. Uh, <laughs> but Carla is right there. <laughs> she's the, she's the guru, so go okay. and see her afterwards. In yeah. the white turtleneck. That's right. Library. Uh, Library, <laughs> 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 <Ivory>, sorry. <laughs> 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 So I, I want to give a shameless plug to the ACSC and to the JCSC as well. You know, um, I think in the last 12 months or so, we have seen a really strong take up of some of the stuff that's happening with the JCSCs and some of the briefings that they're doing as well. So if you're not a member of the JCSCs, you should be. Um, so look, we're, we're, this is what we're, we're seeing here today is everyone leaning in. Right, so this is the first time I'm actually excited about people leaning in. It's, up until now, it's been, why the hell isn't everyone leaning in? How do we get everyone to lean in? Now everyone's leaning in. So this is where we roll up our sleeves and get the work done. So yeah, definitely, if you if you haven't joined the TISN, you should definitely be doing that. Look at the JCSCs. Go and speak to Jono about um, what we're doing with the Center of Excellence for Insider Risk and, and how you can get on board with that as well. The question was about um, Soki and, and what you do first. My, my recommendation is have a meeting. Just have work out what you're doing already and what more you can do. Just start with a meeting. Simple step. Yep. Possibly a slightly shorter meeting than this one, but <laughs> <laughs> focus time with some action items at the end. That, that, that'd be a good start. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a very good point. There is so much, most likely, there is so much already happening in your organisation. It's just not all happening together. Yep. Um, it's all very disparate. It's, it's looking at the events as opposed to the the threat, um, and it, and it's probably simpler than you think if you if you manage to get together all of the elements mm -hmm. that, are, that are already doing stuff. Most of you, I'm sure, if you're critical infrastructure companies, are going to have high levels of probity already before people join you. Mm -hmm. You're going to have some uh, sort of offboarding controls um, when you leave the organisation. You're going to have some sort of ongoing monitoring of high risk roles and and so on. And even if you don't have a lot, or if if you, you you don't have have it anywhere near the level that you want it to be, it's something, and it's something to start on. And it's it, it, the fact that it already exists in a small way means there's already an appetite for it mm -hmm. from from people above, or it wouldn't have existed in the first place. So just expressing that um, as a as a just a larger mm. piece. Um, may not be as difficult as it might sound. Yep. I think my, the other thing is don't take a compliance view. If you're taking compliance, it's a wrong, it's a wrong lens. Take a yes. security view because yes. compliance will come from that. Yep. If compliance allows everyone to live up to a baseline, right? But mm -hmm. if you're taking a good security lens, compliance will come. Yep. It help. I mean, obviously the framework, but look at that security lens mm -hmm. first versus compliance. 100%. That's a really good point. I think my also, if you're in a senior leadership role or you want to get a senior leadership role in any company, um, you, you generally get what you inspect rather than what you expect from these types of standards. And, and in looking at it, there is nothing in SOGI that's, that's particularly new, difficult, um, complex. <laughs> They're all things that, that exist um, and have existed for a very long time. And, and probably for the most part, the um, opportunities for improvement will be um, maybe some, some tweaks, maybe there are some gaps, but most of the <coughs> opportunities will be in um, demonstrating the ability to demonstrate compliance to these things rather than having to mm -hmm. do them um, from scratch. I, I, would, I would suggest that the most difficult thing about this is actually herding the cats, <laughs> right? Like asking the right questions of the right folks across the organisation and getting them together for that meeting. That's the hardest part, because once you've got them there for the meeting, yeah. they will be engaged if you're saying the right things and using the right language. Have some catering too, a bit of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Make it genial, that'd be great. Vegan brownies, preferably. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Any more questions before we break for drinks?
Yes. Please. So not so much a question, but an observation. Please. And that is that there is already a really good broad benchmarking partner out there for insider risk. Uh -huh. And that's the safety domain. Yes. When we think about yes. just culture, normalization 100%. of deviance, human safe. factors, uh, senior executive engagement, a lot of the hard thinking is already being done. Mm -hmm. And it sits there in, in, in a lot of the writing and research and practice that's out there now for safety too. 100%. So if people want to look into that, just look up things that Sidney Decker uh, has written. Uh, and he's written probably about six or seven books in this area uh, around safety too thinking or resilience engineering, which is the mm -hmm. European version of it. Mm -hmm. And it's everything we've been talking about today. Safety has been going through it there for the last go. 10, 15, 20 yes. years. Well, they so haven't necessarily just cracked it all. Different domain, right? That's like right. It's the same risk. It's just still people, just online and digital yeah. stuff, right? They haven't cracked everything, mm. but they've got a lot of answers to the questions we've been asking yep. today. Don't reinvent the wheel. Mm. Good one. Yeah. Oh, question. Yes, please. Hi. I'm Monica Whitty. I'm a professor of human factors and cyber security, and, and Mo knows that I've done many, many, many years of research in insider threats. There you have. Although we talk about um, the accidental and malicious, and we know that they're very different patterns and all the rest. I'm actually a psychologist, and I do interdisciplinary work across all the domains and look at the culture as well. And we have a big project, as Mo knows, um, funded by Defence, looking at these issues and some cracking findings that nobody knows about yet. And I'm, I've been listening in interest to everyone here, which is wonderful. Um, and I just, I guess, and I've worked in the UK and Sufi and I gave us a very big project. Homer was a, a small project we also worked alongside, but we did a <coughs> project over there. Um, and I'm just wondering why there's not academic speaking here, because I'm worried, uh, what I would love to see in the experience I had in the UK is our voice was heard and we want, we're keen to shape the agenda. We, we're keen to help you all understand things at a much higher level now because we know it at a much higher level and that could help change everything that you're talking about today. So I guess I'm wondering about process and how we can actually do that. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great, 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 great. Yeah, so I am an academic. <laughs> 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 No, it's, uh, I thought I recognised you, Monica. Yeah. And it's lovely to see a female on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I remember your presentation at one of the, um, the so Cyber Awareness Week or something like that about romance scams. And oh. I love your work on romance scams. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Monica's work. Um, I was actually chatting, I was chatting to um, Debbie Ashenden about exactly this not that mm -hmm. long ago. Um, and she's in town on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which I'm planning to catch up with her then. But you are exactly right. And I think what's interesting is that my you know, interactions as part of the academic community that a lot of these conversations are still very much centred on the School of IT mm. Mm. or Schools of Engineering and the like, and you get a very particular perspective and, you know, God love my colleagues, it's there and talk about how we Although, need to do blockchain I'm, with something. And well, I'm the head of department for software systems and cyber security, so I, I work amongst them and lead them as well. So, yeah, it, yeah. it is interesting, isn't it? but we can all work together, as you say, and I really got that from everything you were saying, I must say, well, too. One thing that I sort of put forward as an idea was that there's a lot of interesting research going on. Where are the strategic objectives, the things that we can all participate in working mm -hmm. towards? Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. I said this in reference more specifically to the, the critical and emerging technologies field. But we need something like that for security problems. Uh, and I do think that there is a very a strong place for that. And there is a precedent for it. We did that with the Next Gen Technologies. Yeah, well, that's the project that we've, we've got. That's We won't yeah. be able to yes. share it. And we're finding yes. it really hard to yeah, go. Yeah. People, we, you can use this stuff and produce it and commercialise it and everything. Well, yeah. let's let's actually do a briefing on that early next year, Monica, because yeah. that, that work is outstanding, some of the stuff that's going on. Um, and absolutely, you, you know that we, we work with the academics and we do a lot of research and we do a lot of uh, a lot of that stuff. I think that 
the, the key thing for today, Monica, was for what we were trying to solve for folks is those critical infrastructure organisations that need to stand up a program and they don't, they just don't know how to start, um, trying to close that gap, and which is why these folks are here because they've spent years actually cracking the nut really hard um, and, and, can sh and are willing and able to share in such an amazing opportunity like this. And, very very grateful for that but but let's we should we should definitely well we're going to run a workshop and invite people to hear our findings so that could be if people are when is that to, when is that monica we wanted to do that probably about february march um and we want people to come to learn from what we're finding so you can implement it so um, we'll, we'll host you come it at to Adelaide Monash. to do that? We can we, do it at we, the same time. Yeah, we, we'll host it at Monash, but we can also host another one at Adelaide because we've got um, Marcus and, and the team there. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Yeah, because yeah. we do it for free, right? We yeah, 100%. 100%. Absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for being here, Monica. <laughs> no, thanks for having me. Mo, oh, just, and again, it's not a question. This is a, a, a plug, really. Um, one of the things I do is I sit on a, a, the Standards Australia Committee responsible for security and resilience. Uh, we're scoping at the moment a new work item to develop a principles-based handbook on insider risk and threat management. Fantastic. Which uh, we'll be looking for expressions of interest for people that want to join the working group. Uh, we'll put together an ad hoc working group early in the new year to develop an outline of the document that will form the basis of the proposal to Standards Australia for approval. Fantastic. And it doesn't, nothing exists like this internationally, so the Australian handbook, once it's published, will then be presented to the International Standards Organisation as a foundation document for a that global standard. Fantastic. Can, can you please sync on that? Um, there's, uh, there's going to be a bunch of folks yeah. here today that will want to participate. That's why I thought it was a good time to plug very, it. Very, very, very good time um, to plug it. And, you know, there's there's a lot of learnings from a lot of people. Mm. It's not just these folks sitting up the front here that can, that can contribute to that piece of work. So very well done. Excellent work. Do we have any last questions? We are standing in the way of a beer. <laughs> Please. <laughs> be bold. Be bold. Okay. Um, no, Comment rather than question from the point of view that, so um, I'm from Australia's Academic Research Network where we have a big infrastructure footprint. We're not a huge company. And so, you know, the, the focus here from the panel, a lot of people, a lot of resources and, and the number of people, maybe there needs to be a way to scale down and be able to help. Definitely. And, and so, I think the TISNs and that sort of thing, they're a, they're a great mechanism. Um, but yeah, being able to create dedicated teams and, and that, that push and pull between yeah. operational responsiveness, which um, I think there was a mention around separating out the operations to the actual governance and control. Sometimes some don't have that luxury. Mm. We're in between, but but that, that sort of concept is really important yeah. too. Nice. On that, I think you can do this from one person or existing right. Yes. But I think lean on us. I'm more than happy to come in and say we've learned some lessons. Don't repeat our mistakes. So we can. Yeah. We're happy to help those who are just establishing, trying to mature. Those who have no clue, try and get to the next level. So I think as panelists, we'll we'll be, I guess, giving back. Yeah. Um, so there's no issue everyone contacts certainly me, and I'm sure most of yeah, the others. So yeah. we're quite small you know, as well. So what do you think? Going through some issues. And I think the community practice will help help those along the journey grow. Well, every, everyone that's here and everybody that's attending online are trusted to us, right? You you all have my email address and a bunch of the organisers, right? So the whole idea of this is for you guys to reach out and for us to connect and for us to help each other. These, I mean, these people are super busy people giving their time because we know how important this is to Australia's <coughs> national security. If we get this wrong, the lights go out, literally. Like we cannot be in that position. So like we, and this, the only way that we can get there is collaboration. The bad guys and girls, I say this, people cringe when I say it, but I'm gonna say it again, I don't care, right? The bad guys and girls collaborate so much better than we do. So that's why we can never keep up. They're so good at it. We gotta get better at it. 
Can I just make a comment on your query as well? I mentioned earlier on the deck security policy framework, which, which the software guarantees would do. So the virtue of that is it, it is risk-based, and it, it says what's good look like. We've only got this much resource and this much time right now. So it gives your, your board, if you like, a defensible plan, an objective to get to, with the argument you can only get this far this year based on what you know and what you've got. So you know, the good news story is it, is it October, Hamish? The first version is going to be due October next year of the annual report. Uh, you know, the good news is you're talking to your seniors, because you mentioned before how far up the chain to get to your CSOs. It, it's not all gloom and doom. This is actually empowering you to start the journey, knowing that you don't have to have the answer by October next year. Yeah. It, it is a journey, and, and I think collectively there's enough goodwill to help people along the way. Yep, 100%. One last question, if we've got it. No? Everyone wants a beer. Hey? Well, guys and girls, thank you so much for um, being here with us today. I hope you guys got a lot out of it. I, I certainly did. I do every time that we do one of these things. But um, to all of the all of the people that have given their time, not just as panel speakers, but all the folks from the A3C, from MITRE, from Providence, from uh, uh, CBA, obviously, and, and to everybody here, please put your hands together. certainly start circulating more information about what Monica is doing, what Defence is doing, uh, and the events that we want to run for early next year. And so hopefully everyone can join us for that too. Thank you all. Thanks, Thank guys. You.